Chapter 15 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 15 Twain River, Karangarua. Douglas Pass, Head Basin of Twain River, Douglas Glacier, Camp, Horace Walker Glacier, Moraines, Lower Valley, Hasty Retreat, Bivouac, A Night with the Typo, Return to Habitation. From Cairn 4, on December 27th, I had been able to examine the Twain Valley from Douglas Glacier to the Great Gorge, and could see that we should have a long day's work, with the Maoris slow travelling, before a suitable camping place could be found in that valley. I therefore decided to sleep near the saddle on the night of the 23rd of January. Leaving one day's food on Christmas Flat, and taking the remainder of our stores, now reduced to sufficient for four days, with reasonable luck in birds, we ascended the slopes toward the saddle, and having found a fairly level place, 1,298 feet above camp, slept out on the grass. At 5.45 a.m. on the 24th, we again moved off, and dropping over into the Macaro Glacier, went about a mile and a quarter up the ice to a saddle, the Douglas Pass, 6,115 feet, on the north side, reaching it at 10 a.m., here I had to spend two hours making observations and continuing a short distance further up the glacier. The formation of the country is most peculiar here and needs a word or two of explanation. As already stated, the Hooker Range branches off from Mount Munga and runs to Mount Howitt before turning in a southerly direction. The Douglas Pass is a high saddle over this part of the range, but lies only twenty or thirty feet above the Macaro Ice. On the Twain side of the pass, however, there is a steep slope, cut up into ice-worn rocky terraces, descending for 1,550 feet onto a small gravel flat half a mile wide by one mile long. Thus, this offshoot of Mount Monga seems to me an imposing range from the Twain, but from the Macaro Glacier appears merely a low rocky ridge rising out of the ice. From the pass the view is weird and magnificent, as indeed is the whole of the Twain Valley, though very limited in extent. Looking northwards, we had on our right and left a ridge rising sharply from us towards Mount Monga and Cairn 4, respectively, and forming the saddle. To the right front, a deep short ravine, surrounded on three sides by overhanging black cliffs, on the top of which several small ice fields are scattered and keep up a running fire of avalanches, forming in the bottom a moraine-covered glacier, which I called after Mr. Fitzgerald, who was in New Zealand at the time with his guide Zurbringen. Forming the eastern end of the ravine in which this glacier lies is the dividing range, well over 8,000 feet, Mount Monga, a very graceful two-horned peak rising at its head. The glacier flows for a mile between the enormous cliffs to the edge of the small gravel flat, 4,562 feet, across which the stream flows to the foot of some immense terraced precipices, which form the left of the picture, and flowing along their base finds its way out of the flat at the northern end under the moraine-covered ice of the Douglas Glacier, which flows past the opening of the basin on the north. Straight in front of us lay the grand neve of the Douglas Glacier, coming off Mount Sefton, which stood in all its white majestic grandeur, framed by these dark and gloomy precipices. This great ice field lies on the sloping rock roof of the Karangarua Range, and is bounded on the east by Mount Sefton, and the west by some precipices, five thousand feet high, rising up to the summit I named Pioneer Peak, when on Cairn 4. It is nearly four miles long and slopes down to the top of a long, sheer, black precipice, varying from 2,000 feet at the west end to 1,000 feet at the eastern end, over which ice avalanches constantly fall, and to form the trunk of the glacier in the valley, nearly four miles in length. Consequently, we have the peculiar picture of a neve running along parallel with the trunk of the glacier, supplying it with avalanches over great cliffs, and not any single point having direct connection with it. The simplest way to form some idea of it would be to imagine an ordinary lean-to, with a roof about three and a half miles by one, and the back wall averaging five hundred feet. The neve lies on the roof and drops its ice over the back wall, forming the glacier which flows along the base of the wall and for half a mile beyond it. The approximate area of the ice field lying on the roof is 2,500 acres. It is probable that a body of water, like the Marleyan Sea by the alleged glacier, was at one time in possession of this basin, fed by the Fitzgerald Glacier, 
and upheld by the Douglas as it flowed past the northern outlet of the flat. When I met Fitzgerald and Zurbriggen later in the season, I could not help regretting that they too had not seen this wonderful sight, which of its kind is the finest scene in our Alps, and I doubt if it can be surpassed anywhere. Looking to the south, the view was cut off by the spurs of the dwarf, but the fine sweep of the Macaro Glacier, as it curved past under the great precipice from the Karangarua Pass and Mount Townsend, was beautiful. Beyond the pass, Fetz, as usual, showed prominently, his fine peak reminding me very much of the Weisshorn. At noon we began the descent into the Twain, and I had the most trying bit of work of the season, for not only had the loads to be lowered down on the rope over the rocky faces, but the Maori and his dog also. Poor old Bill did his best, but is not a mountaineer. He is only an honest Maori who was never built to do alpine work. We had the pea rifle with us and managed to shoot two kias on the way down. A short, quick tramp took us across to the northern end of the flat, and four hours, three of which were occupied in going two miles over the worst moraine I know, brought us at 7 p.m. to a small flat, a quarter of a mile below the Douglas Glacier, where we rigged up a rough shelter near some stunted scrub, 3,600 feet above sea level. The Maori's sandals, of course, made him very slow, and were cut up quickly by the sharp stones of the moraine, and the last of the three pairs he had brought with him came to pieces on his arrival at camp. While making our shelter of scrub we got four wekas, and though without salt or sugar, indeed, we were getting used to it now, had a good meal, the first since 6 a.m., and were soon asleep in our blankets. On the 25th, I went down the valley to the terminal of the Horace Walker Glacier, 3,511 feet, about a mile below camp, and skirting along its great lateral moraine traversed the grassy and rocky slopes, until I could see through the great gorge into Castle's Flat. Having completed the lower portion of the valley, I descended to a most interesting system of lateral moraines near the Horace Walker. This glacier flows from a basin formed by Pioneer Peak and the Karangarua Range and descends in a westerly direction for nearly two miles, and then sweeps round until, at its terminal face, it is almost flowing in an easterly direction, the whole roughly forming a large horseshoe. At the point where it comes out of its valley, it has formed a very fine lateral moraine on the outer side of the curve, and behind this moraine is the perpendicular series of smaller moraines mentioned above. From the top of the present lateral moraine on one side to the ice is over 100 feet, and on the other to the river there is about 450 feet descent. About the middle of the curve on the river side of this lateral moraine, and 60 feet below it, there is a series of semicircular moraines with great gaps or openings in their sides, like gates in an old Roman fortification, and in front of each such opening a small moraine has been thrown up, as if to cover the entrance to the fortress. These small terraces are 10 to 20 feet high, and extend in curve after curve for 200 or 300 yards in the widest part, until there is a large unbroken semicircular moraine, which falls away nearly 400 feet on the river side, but is only 30 feet high on the inner side of the fortress. It would have been an ideal place to defend in ancient days, and really seems to have been built by human hands, each earthwork being thrown up with great accuracy. I find some difficulty in accounting for these old moraines, for they are lower than the present lateral. Had they been higher, there would be good reason to suppose that the glacier at one period of its existence took a wider sweep before turning up the valley. There may have been a large terminal moraine thrown across the valley by the ancient ice flow of the Douglas Glacier, and the Horace Walker, being unable to cut its way through, has been turned in its course. I'm not, however, prepared to allow that these great moraine deposits belong to the Douglas Glacier, but am of opinion that the Horace Walker has been responsible for them entirely. It is more than probable that the ice originally flowed directly down its valley and came out at right angles to the Twain, forming in the first place an outer moraine across about two-thirds of its terminal face, and having its outflow at the other side where the moraine did not exist, and then, retreating a little way, deposited another great moraine, partly terminal and partly lateral, which now forms the high lateral moraine. This was followed by a considerable shrinkage, until the glacier was smaller than it is now, and then a period of advance set in, causing the ice to flow down against the old terminal moraine, and being unable to push it aside, turned along its base and flowed down to its present position. Had this been the case, the glacier would have the old terminal moraine along its side and make it appear to be a lateral moraine. 
otherwise I am at a loss to account for the easterly curve of the glacier up the valley, unless some such old moranic deposit caused it to do so. The natural course would appear to be down the rapidly descending main valley of the Twain River. From point H, above this lateral moraine, a general view of the valley can be obtained, and the wonderful precipices bounding it on the south are seen to advantage. From the Douglas Glacier to Castles Flat, the whole of the southern side is walled in by rocky precipices, descending from terrace to terrace for 2,000 and even 3,000 feet. At the base of these the river flows, having formed here and there a small flat of an acre or less, behind the short buttresses, they can hardly be called spurs, of the range. About a mile and a half after it leaves the Douglas Glacier, the river is joined by the short but deep stream from the Horace Walker Ice, and a mile further, having passed along the foot of the moraines of that glacier, it descends rapidly through a narrow and deep gorge. Apparently, it has here encountered a rocky bar across the valley, and has cut a narrow black-looking channel of over two hundred feet in depth at the lower end, while at the upper end, where it first encounters the bar, it has only been able to wear away a shallow channel of a few feet. On each side of the gorge is a level floor of water-worn rock, and at the lower end the walls cannot be many feet apart. I had not time to go down and inspect this place closely. Lower down the valley, after another deep but short gorge between two picturesque rocky bluffs has been passed, the precipices, as it were, retire back from the river and rise out of a gentle slope of debris which lies at their base for three or four hundred feet and is covered with vegetation. Above this slope the cliffs are more sheer than before, and in places look as if they had been rough-hewn by human hands for hundreds of feet. After flowing along the foot of the short slopes, for a mile the river turns to the left, and descends rapidly over the great cataracts through the gorge to Castles Flat. On the northern side of the valley the Karangarua Range rises gently, at an angle of about thirty degrees, broken here and there by terraces of rock, and its grassy slopes evidently having little hold on the rock underneath, for spaces of smooth rock can be seen where the soil has slipped or been washed away. Above the Horace Walker stream is a grassy flat of about twenty acres, on which numerous heaps of old moraine are to be seen, and after passing along at the foot of the terrace, another flat is to be found higher up the valley of similar size, at the edge of which we were camping. For a quarter of a mile between the camp and the glacier, there was a confused mass of moraine hillocks and large erratic blocks, more or less covered with stunted scrub, and beyond this again, filling the upper portion of the valley, is the moraine-covered trunk of Douglas Glacier, 3,663 feet, flowing at the foot of black cliffs, parallel with its grand neve, which descends like a great white mantle from Mount Sefton's mighty shoulders. During the day I had been rather anxiously looking out for some flax to take back to Bill, with which he could make some more parara, and at one time I feared there was none growing in the valley. If there had not been any, it would have been very exceptional, for it grows as high as any other mountain scrub. It would have also been most awkward, because Bill could not have gone back barefooted. However, on the Horace Walker moraines I found some, and cut enough for all purposes, for I wanted some for the bread also. This year, when away from Castle's Flat, I used to knead the flour on a flax mat, and bake the bread on a flat stone over the fire, which turned out, perhaps, better bread than the frying pan. Having cut all the flax that we were likely to require, I set fire to the scrub on the old moraines, little thinking that I was starting more than an ordinary conflagration. The scrub, however, was dry, owing to a prolonged spell of fine weather, and burnt for three whole days, filling the valley with a dense cloud of smoke, which was seen, so I heard afterwards, over Mount Sefton at the Hermitage. This burning of scrub will benefit any future expeditions, for it never grows again, and will leave a few open patches in unexpected places. On the way down from camp in the morning, I had avoided the Horace Walker stream by crossing on the ice, but as I was now traversing the main river, up along the side, I had to ford the stream near where it joined the river. It has a very rapid descent, and was dirty, and fairly high after the hot day, so I found it rather awkward to cross, and when just in the center I trod on a large loose stone and fell over. Luckily, my hands came onto another stone near the surface of the water, so I was able quickly to recover my footing but had they gone into deeper water, nothing could have saved me from being washed out into the main stream, which was rushing along toward its rapid descent into the gorge. 
the twain is unfordable in the summer from the glacier to castle's flat and like all other such mountain torrents it would kill a man by dashing his head against a boulder before it drowned him the cold of the water is of course intense even where it joins the karangarua miles below the glacier the temperature was just under forty degrees fahrenheit when at bark camp on my return i measured the daily rise and fall of the river in fine weather due to the melting of the ice up the twain the stream at that point was about eighty yards broad and the rise and fall varied from three to six inches in the twenty-four hours according to the temperature of the day no doubt if such measurements could be extended over a long period some interesting figures could be recorded as to the melting caused by the sun in summer and winter my measurements only extended over three days and were therefore of little value arriving at camp about seven p m i found that bill had cooked the rest of the birds which we found on the evening before but had failed to find any more on the twenty sixth i was again working in the lower part of the valley for nearly ten hours these long days of heavy climbing were hard work as the maori was no good on the hills and had to be left in camp also i had to carry twenty-five pounds of instruments cameras and books all day a constant handicap in fact ever since the beginning of december all the high work had to be done alone and i had no companion on any expedition from camp on the mountains bill spent his day in making sandals and looking for birds but had no luck so we were again reduced to small rations we had only brought enough stores into the twain to last us for four days if we got plenty of birds in fact we were practically depending on the latter entirely and the little flour etc was not equal to more than one or two fair meals no one had been into the valley before therefore birds should have been plentiful as they were in the karangarua valley but not only did we get none except the four above mentioned but also those four were too poor to be of much use there was still work for two days to be done and i dared not risk being caught in bad weather here because our retreat would have been cut off so instead of taking a day off on sunday the twenty sixth i went up the horace walker glacier to the foot of the ice fall though of no great size this glacier is very fine and has only one small patch of surface moraine on it about a mile from the terminal face before it reaches the twain valley it is bounded on the northwestern side by fine precipices of nine hundred to three hundred feet in height on the top of which a large secondary glacier lies and drops frequent avalanches on to the trunk of the horace walker this upper ice field i named the pilkington glacier and it comes from a nice-looking peak mount glorious and forms a snow saddle between the twain and regina creek valleys draining partly into the latter the neve of the horace walker is of considerable extent and lies in a basin formed by the karangarua range and the short high spur on which is pioneer peak a fine ice fall between high cliffs connects it with the trunk had there not been several photographic plates and some notebooks left in various parts of the upper karangarua valley i should have endeavoured to pilot the maori over the pilkington snowfield into the regina creek valley making an ascent of mount glorious on the way from that peak a view into the copeland valley could be obtained and much useful work done but it was not a fit climb for one man and my companion was not equal to it he was willing but utterly unable to do these things how i regretted that douglas or some good man was not here with me wondering why this work was not considered worth the additional slight expense of a third member to our party on returning to camp i was aware that had the maori found no birds our meal would only consist of a small slice of bread and i could see by bill's face that he had found nothing so did not ask any questions when the billy had boiled and tea had been made i took the last scone but one out of the bag and quartered it one piece each for tea and one piece each for next morning these scones were round and six inches in diameter by nearly an inch thick so it can be seen that a quarter is not a sumptuous repast to my intense surprise bill said i mean no hungry and refused his quarter i knew he had not eaten anything all day any more than i had because there had been two scones in the bag that morning i therefore exclaimed not hungry that's all humbug i me big feed to-day said bill belly full me feel gland what did you have i asked oh plenty food you fell half bleed he said i me had maori hen weka peri good i knew this was not true because there were no feathers round the camp so i said you old sinner where are the feathers but he stuck to his point and replied you fell work all day 
I mean lie down all day and have good sleep, sleep, and no hungry. You fell half bread. It was evident then that the old boy wanted me to have all the food because I had been working and go without himself, having tried to tell a lie about the weka, but protesting was no use. He still held out and said he was not hungry. At last I said, All right, old man, if you can't eat that bread now, put it aside till tomorrow. You are not going to starve yourself for me. We are both in the same boat. This did not satisfy him, but after half an hour I saw him take the bread and eat it quietly, as there was evidently no chance of my taking it. I could not help being touched by his unselfishness, which fully corroborated the many stories we hear of what fine characters some of the old Maoris have, quite different to the younger generation of natives, I fear. So far the weather had been cloudless and perfect, but a great change appeared on the following morning. Instead of the beautiful clear blue of the New Zealand sky, there were high, black, windy-looking clouds drifting from the northwest, the forerunners of bad weather. The effect of an approaching northwest storm is very grand in the high ranges of the west coast. It first shows in the shape of high, light, filmy clouds, which drift slowly over and far above the dividing range, gradually thickening and closing together, until they appear like a coal-black curtain against which the eternal snows of the Grand Peaks stand out with weird distinctness. A few hours after this black-looking pall has passed behind the range, ragged and torn clouds roll in from the sea at a level of from 4,000 to 6,000 feet, and cover everything, bringing with them the rain. Accordingly, I could see that we should be fortunate if the weather remained fine for even twenty-four hours. Hastily swallowing our quarter scone and cup of tea at six a.m., we rolled everything up preparatory to a quick retreat out of the valley. I gave the Maori most of the things to carry and sent him on up the moraine-covered glacier to the small gravel flat under Douglas Pass, and followed with the instruments and camera, making rapid observations and carrying the traverse up the trunk of the glacier. On reaching the flat about 2 p.m. I spent two hours traversing it round, fixing more stations, and going a little way on to Fitzgerald Glacier, and at 4 p.m. returned to the large rock at the northern end of the flat, near the moraine of the Douglas, under which we intended to bivouac if necessary. By this time, however, the rain clouds had obscured the main peaks, and I was unable to fix the point from which my baseline was to start, so reluctantly decided to make the best of a bad job and stay here in spite of the storm, and no food. From this flat we could retire to Christmas Flat at a pinch in any weather, but at the camp below Douglas two hours rain would have cut us off completely by flooding two creeks which we had to cross. Rather than go away, leaving the work incomplete, I determined to stay on this flat for another day at least, though there was only enough grass to boil the billy with difficulty. By sunset we had chained the baseline and turned into our blankets, having eaten a quarter of the last remaining scone. I shall never forget the grandeur of that night, and I do not think the Maori will either, though for a different reason. Within fifty yards of us the hillside rose sheer for nearly one thousand feet, and then in tiers and ledges for the same height above to near Cairn 4, and looked as if it might at any moment fall forward and annihilate us. Half a mile away the Douglas Neve sent down its ice avalanches all through the night, sometimes twenty-five, sometimes thirty in the hour. These crashed down with a sharp report like a great gun, echoing and re-echoing from cliff to cliff, surrounding that great basin. The thunder of one had hardly died away before the next began. And then at midnight the storm burst on us with its peals of thunder and its vivid lightning, adding to the noise of the avalanches and causing an indescribable din, as the crash of the thunder and roar of the avalanches echoed from the surrounding precipices, sounding as if all the demons of ancient and modern times were loose. Poor old Bill, no likey, and during the hour or two after midnight, while this overwhelming noise was going on, I believe he was calling all the gods to witness that he would never come into such a place again. Every now and then, with a nervous laugh, he would say, I me tinky typo, devil, here. Fortunately, at three a.m. it had calmed down, so I got up and saw that the mists were lifting, giving me an opportunity at four o'clock to fix my baseline. At seven a.m. we ate the last quarter of the remaining scone, and rolling up our loads, went over to the foot of the ascent to the pass. The mist, however, would not give me a chance of seeing the proper route, till we had waited for an hour or more, but at last an opening gave me the line to take, 
and we began our climb. The rope was necessary three or four times to give my companion and his dog a help over the rocks, but he travelled well, and needed much less nursing than on our descent. After reaching the pass, descending the Macaro Glacier, and dropping over the Karangarua Pass in a thick, wet mist, we made Christmas flat in the afternoon, having got three kias on the way. Here a glorious stew and a large feed of porridge soon made us less hungry, and helped us to enjoy the luxury of even a batwing after our long spell of a month in makeshift shelters. The three days of starvation in the Twain was my fault entirely, for I deliberately took the risk, instead of going down to our depot for more provisions. However, I believe that anyone in my place would have done the same, that is, taken the risk, rather than going down the river and punching up more stores over that rough ground. The 30th of January was very cold and wet, snow falling round the camp, so we stayed in our batwing by a good fire all day. On the following morning we went down to Lame Duck Creek, as there was nothing to eat at Christmas Flat, having given up waiting for the few additional observations I had hoped to obtain, for the weather was still bad. Here we were again amongst our friends the birds, catching three ducks and two weckas. On the 1st of February we again moved on, reaching the rat trap in the afternoon, where I stayed for four days, having to make a climb on each side of the valley. I sent the Maori down with part of our impedimenta to Bark Camp on Castle's Flat, telling him to bring back some sugar, flour, and salt. It may be remembered that we left four days' provisions at the Rat Trap on our way up the river, but of these the flour had turned black with damp, and the jam was fermenting in the tin. On the Maori's return he stated that there was no sugar at Castle's Flat, a great disappointment, as it was now more than two weeks since we had any. Consequently, I was tempted to eat the jam, which, owing to fermentation in a tin, may have become poisoned. On turning the pot round in my hand, however, I saw a guarantee by the maker, Kirkpatrick of Nelson N.Z., that his tins were especially prepared, and no chemical action could be produced by fermentation. So I decided to take the risk, for we were hungering for something sweet. I suggested to Bill that we should toss up, as to who was to try it first, but he laughed and said, you me both eat. We therefore each took some, and between us finished the whole of it. Next morning I had forgotten all about the jam, when Bill suddenly said, You me, no dead, jam no bad. This reminds me of an occasion some weeks before, on which the Maori lost his footing, and fell over a sheer drop of fifteen feet, onto some rocks below. I did not hear him fall, but was astonished by a shout from below. I me no dead, I me right and on making investigations we found he had fallen onto his load, which, as is usually the case, had turned him over onto his back, and he was practically unhurt. On the 4th of February we went down to Bark Camp and spent two or three days, generally washing up, patching our rags, bathing, and posting up the field books. The Maori had a complete change of good clothes here, but mine were at Scott's, so I had to do the best with my present rags. It was little use trying to mend my nether garments, for they consisted of canvas patches fastened together by other patches, very little of the original stuff remaining, but care enabled me to make them sufficiently decent to appear at Scott's by binding them round my legs with flax. When Bill put on his good clothes, he looked a terrific swell beside me, and I told him so, saying, Well, Bill, old man, they'll think you are my master. But he would not admit it. Oh, no, he said. You fell to boss still. On the seventh we wended our way down to the low country, and calling at the futa for a pair of boots which I had left here in November, those I had on having completely come to an end, we arrived at Scott's farm in the evening, just a day or two over nineteen weeks since I last saw a habitation, for I had been in the ranges ever since we originally left on October 1st, 1894, and never been nearer to it than the futa during that period. End of chapter 15《ハプシクティーン》of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 16. Karangarua District. Pleasures of Habitation. My New Companion. A Climb on Scott's Hill. General Features of the Country. Ancient Glaciers. Rotit Koiti. Alpine Vegetation. Insect Life at High Altitudes. The pleasure of such homely food as potatoes, cabbages, and other vegetables, 
with mutton and bread, cannot be realized until one has been without them for months. Since October the previous year, I had not had any vegetable except ferns and a few onions, and our bread had been either ordinary damper, flour and water, or soda bread. The cream and milk, too, seemed far better than any I had ever tasted. Again, a man must spend a long period away from habitation before he can thoroughly appreciate a chair and table, for we had with us absolutely no luxury, nor had we an army of porters to carry tents, bedsteads, mattresses, etc., but had to content ourselves with some scrub branches or ferns to lie on, and a log in front of the bedding, about four or five inches in height, to sit upon while in our shelter. It may therefore be easily understood that a chair and table for our meals were very welcome, after months with the plate, when we had one, balanced on our knees while sitting on a log. It must not be supposed that I am bemoaning the discomfort of the work, because, though it might be rough and uncomfortable to the average man, I did not find it either the one or the other. But the comfort of even a rough farmhouse in South Westland is welcome for a change. It is also worth while to have hair and beard several inches long, in order to have the pleasure of a good crop, even with a pair of sheep shears. When we arrived at Scott's in February, I could tuck my hair under the collar of my shirt, and my beard was long and tangled. I found Douglas very little better, and only able to walk a few yards. He had been confined to his bed for some weeks after he had returned. It was perfectly useless for him to attempt further work, so we got a young fellow, Dick Fidian, recently out from England and digging at Hunt's Beach, to accompany me. I regretted afterwards that he had not been sent up to me when first Douglas came back in October, for he was a capital mate and plucky, which is more than can be said of the man who left me at Castle's Flat. He was also a good walker, and had the makings of a climber, so would have been, on the whole, preferable to poor old Bill. The Maori evidently had an exaggerated opinion of my powers, because not only did he give the road party on the Haas Pass track an extraordinary account of my climbing, but he went to see Dick and warned him that the work was pelly luff, rough, and also saying, you fell no follow Harper into hills, too teepy, tate up. Oh, yes, said Dick, I can manage if he helps me with the rope. Well, you fell. See me light, you know follow. See the monkey climb to pole? Asked Bill, working his hands and feet to indicate one of those toys that run up and down a stick. Yes, often, said Dick. Well, Harper, he just the same as the monkey. However, Dick decided to come in spite of the Maori's wonderful yarns, and I could not have had a better companion than he proved to be. Instructions came from Pocatica to say that they had decided to try a saddle at the head of the Copeland River for a track to the Hermitage in spite of the fact that it carried perpetual ice. I was to send in my map, etc., of the Karangarua country first, and then go over to the Hermitage via the Copeland River and report. This is the line I and others had wanted the authorities to examine for some two or three years past, so these instructions were very welcome. Accordingly, Dick and I went up to Bark Camp, and brought the stores and other things which were there to the footer, and then sent up horses from Scots to bring everything down to the flats, and, crossing the river, moved them up to a mile below the inflow of the Copeland, or further if possible. Here Dick was to camp and blaze a track up the spur to the grass line on Ryan's Peak, which we had to ascend later for some observations, while I plotted and sent in the map. Mr. Scott has a few sheep on the hill on the south of the river, where it flows out of the ranges, and finds the snow grass above the bush line very good pasturage in the summer. He had, however, left the animals there too long the previous season, and was unable to muster, owing to the winter snow having driven the sheep down into the thick scrub. Hearing that he was going up again, I decided to accompany him and go back along the ridge to get a good view over Castle's Flat and other parts of the river for a few more observations and photographs. Leaving Dick, therefore, to continue the track up Ryan's Spur, I went with Scott up the sheep hill, and pushing back, we camped at the head of the Manakaau Creek, which flows out near Jacob's River. One of the party was a young Maori, Dan Koiti who was an excellent man on the hills, and he told me that, a month previously, he had followed some sheep back further than anyone had been, and found a large lake. Doubting his story somewhat, I went with him next day to a place where we could see not only the lake, which did exist after all, but also an extensive panorama of the ranges. While Dan went down to the water and back to our bivouac by another route, I spent my time in completing the observations, etc. From this point, R., 
a view of all three branches could be obtained, and an accurate idea formed of the size and direction of the vast ancient glaciers which evidently filled these valleys. The country appeared more weird than it did when we were up the river. The gigantic rock precipices and smooth slopes showed to advantage, and the very narrow ridges and evidence everywhere proved how hard and solid the rock was. The peculiar conformation of this district was also plainly visible, but it was no easier to account for than when up the valley. Every divergent range, and every spur on such ranges, in this district, have a sloping side and a precipitous side, thus. In all the branches of the Karangarua this is most evident. For instance, on the range between the Twain and the main branch, I was able on the Karangarua side to walk up a bare slope of smooth rock, only interrupted in places by a bluff or low cliff, running across or down it. But the vast precipices on the Twain side not only appear to be impossible to scale, but are equally hard to describe. Again in the Twain we have the slope of the Douglas Neve, to the summit of the range on the southern side. But in the Copeland Valley the same range drops in enormous cliffs onto Welcome Flats. Between the Copeland River and Cook's we find on the southern side of the Copeland Range comparatively long spurs, but on the northern there are inaccessible cliffs of Copeland Peak which I attempted to describe in a former chapter. Take one example of the spurs of these divergent ranges, namely the ridge between Regina Creek and Twain Gorge. Here we find a slope varying from 32 degrees to 36 degrees, and in a few places a trifle more on the Twain side, but Regina Creek is walled in on that bank by steep precipices. The slope on the Karangarua range is the same as the dip of the rock, and it is probable that the great precipices are due to the fracture of the formation. Unfortunately, however, I am not sufficiently well grounded in geology to attempt a solution or explanation of this peculiarity. Therefore, having described it to the best of my ability, I shall leave it for others to explain. For studying the action of ancient glaciers on mountains and valleys, this river and its branches give as good opportunities as any district I know. From the inflow of the Copeland River to Castles Flat, the valley is roughly speaking a mile wide, filled with glacial deposit which descends in gentle slopes from the lower part of the hills to the center of the valley. Through this moraine drift the river has cut a channel, leaving terraces on each side from twenty feet to nearly one hundred feet high, while its course is full of large erratic blocks, in some places completely blocking the valley. The top of the terrace is chiefly flat for some chains back, cut through here and there by deep channels, and generally covered with large boulders. At the end of the spur, opposite the inflow of the Copeland River, the glacial drift is piled up for some four hundred feet, while the spur itself, above and behind the drift, shows in places ice-smoothed rock. The slopes of Mount McGloin and other mountains into Castles Flat have been described in a former chapter. Above the flat the valley narrows to half its original width, and the whole floor rises abruptly for twelve hundred feet the ancient ice having evidently come down in an ice fall at this point. The faces of the abrupt step in the valley are rounded and smooth, forming what might be called whalebacks. From this point to the saddle, the valley has been cut out of hard, nice rock, and has high bare cliffs on the south, and smooth rocky slopes on the left, while the floor is of the same rock, and slopes gently down on the south, from the foot of the precipices to the river, broken here and there by terraces. In the upper portion of the valley, from Lame Duck Flat to the Saddle, the rock floor has been covered with moranic drift, as the ancient glacier retreated up the valley, and debris from the hillsides. In places, the whole surface of soil and boulders has slipped away, leaving naked rock slopes. At Lame Duck Flat, the river runs on a smooth rocky bottom, and from here to the bar below Castle's Flat, it has evidently met with less obstruction, and, flowing over rock unprotected by debris, has gradually cut the floor down to its present level. After leaving this flat, the river descends gradually through the Dovetail Gorge to the Great Cataracts, leaving behind it on the left a rock terrace, which gradually grows in height as the river descends, until at the cataract it is upward of three hundred feet high. From the top of this terrace there is a gentle slope, for a few hundred yards back, of smooth rock, interrupted by two or three terraces, to the foot of the great solid precipices, which rise from one to two thousand feet above. This was evidently the old valley bottom, abraded by the ice. In places where a creek comes down to join the river, broad roads of bare rock have been cleared by the water through the trees, interrupted by a few waterfalls, 
and on reaching the terrace drop over into the river making picturesque cascades picturesque because the rock is worn into fantastic grooves and channels the actual cataracts are i imagine due to the large erratic blocks left behind by the ice in its retreat forming a bar across the valley and the hills being too steep to hold them they have fallen and accumulated at the bottom these have gradually collected in the gorge as the water has cut away the ground underneath, and, having collected, are now preventing the water from further deepening the gorge. The stones in the cataracts of the three branches, meeting in castles, are of immense size. It is possible that large blocks of rock have broken away and come down from the hill on the right bank, and also slips may have helped to form the Karangarua cataract, but the other two, Twain River and Regina Creek, are solely due to large boulders left by the old glacier. There is a curious freak of nature, which I have not mentioned before, on the main branch. In the gorge, by the great cataract, the bush, as in all other valleys, is composed of large rata, kamahi, totra, and miro trees. But suddenly on the south bank this class of timber ceases, and the mountain birch begins. The line of demarcation is very marked, and neither class of tree encroaches on the other. On the north bank, the usual rata forest continues with only two or perhaps three birch trees on that side, but on the south bank the latter have absolute possession till the Theodore Falls and Creek are reached just above Lame Duck Flat. Here they cease as suddenly as they began, and the usual mountain vegetation continues on both sides to the head of the river. On Christmas Flat, however, a clump of about a dozen large birch trees can be seen towering above the low mountain scrub. It is a curious freak of nature, and I can see no reason for it. The real birch forest country does not commence for some distance south of this river, and this isolated patch of birch forest is the only I know of in this district. Judging from the general appearance and formation of this part of the country, I believe that in the remote past an immense ice field existed south of Mount Sefton and discharged itself in three mainstream seawards. The low saddle of the Douglas Pass would form no obstacle to the junction of the ice fields off Sefton and those further south. Even assuming that the limit of the ice smooth surfaces coincides with the level of the ancient glaciers, and that they were no higher than these marks are now found, the streams of ice flowing from this central field must have been of great depth, for they have left marks with great distinctiveness in the Twain and Karangarua valleys. The spur from Mount Glorious which divides the Twain and Regina Creek valleys, has a high rocky hill of conical shape rising at its extremity, some 3,700 feet above Castle's Flat. Behind this is a low, flat-topped depression, and it seems evident that the most northern stream of ice flowed down the Twain Valley and covered the lower end of this spur, being joined by a small glacier from the north down Regina Valley. The central stream came over the Karangarua Pass and down the main valley, joining the northern stream in Castle's Flat. It then flowed against the hill on which we are now supposed to be, close to Mount MacDonald, and has, I think, left its mark in the number of large blocks which lie on the side in places. Then, turning in a northerly direction, it would join forces with a great glacier which filled the valley of the Copeland River and came over Baker's Saddle from the central neve, or the Mount Cook of that day. The combined ice flow would by this time have assumed enormous proportions, far exceeding the ancient Waiho Glacier, and larger than the old Cook River Glacier, and, flowing out onto the flats, would no doubt augment the great ice field at the base of the hills. These glaciers must all have been of considerable thickness, and it is perhaps possible that the Twain and Karangarua ice streams overflowed the ridge below Point R on the map, to a slight extent, before turning towards the lower country. There is a depression in that ridge, in a direct line with a depression behind the conical hill, a line drawn from the present Douglas Glacier down the Monokai Ao River would pass through both depressions. That ice has been at work in the head of the latter river in the past, there is ample evidence. But the most interesting and weird Roche Moutonnet at the source of that river may only be due to smaller local glacier having no distinct connection with a larger one. I am inclined to think that the above mentioned depression here is accidental and has no connection with the one behind the conical hill, being rather too high above sea level. Further evidence, however, is forthcoming of the great depth of ice on Ryan's Peak, which Dick and I ascended later in the season. There were two distinct lines of boulders, 
lying on the Copeland side of the peak at a height of over 4,000 feet above the sea, which had every appearance of a lateral moraine. The ice lines in the upper valleys of the Karangarua and Twain, which are to be seen as high as 5,800 feet above sea level, and fully 3,000 feet above the present floor of the valley, all point to the same fact. On the period of retreat beginning, the glaciers which shrink and leave behind them the great mass of moraine accumulations in the valley below Castles Flat, and by the inflow of the Copeland River. Also, in the latter river there are large erratic blocks, scattered on the hillsides by the retreating ice. Having gradually retired up the valley and separated from the Copeland Glacier, the Twain ice would probably find its way over the low depression into Regina Creek, and, at the same time, send another stream down the gorge. Douglas, however, from what he saw at Bark Camp, is not inclined to believe that ice ever came through this gorge, but thinks it is due to a fissure in the rock formation. This I cannot agree with, for the western side has been most certainly abraded by ice, and there is a large loose boulder lying on a ledge some way up the precipice on the eastern side of the gorge. My opinion is that the Twain Glacier found its way to Castles Flat through this opening long after the Karangarua had retreated above the cataracts, and is responsible for the bar of moraine which I found on the flat. I have mentioned already Crusoe's Island and Queen's Knoll, which are evidently remains of a moraine, for on following the line back towards Mount McLoin, I found other small heaps of boulders. There is in my mind, no doubt, that an ice stream came over the Karangarua Pass, for the rock is ice-worn, and large blocks scattered on its slopes. There are also three distinct ice lines in the valley, especially noticeable between the Pass and Troit River. I believe that this glacier would not be cut off from the central ice field until it had retired up the valley to Castles Flat. But as the period of shrinkage progressed, there is no doubt that it would suddenly be separated from the main source of supply of the Karangarua Pass, which is upwards of 5,600 feet above sea level and having no high peaks near it from which to draw fresh supplies, it would suddenly and rapidly retreat up the valley from Castles Flat to the head, for I presume the fact of so little moranic deposit in the upper portion of this valley is due to a sudden retreat such as this. The idea of a stream of ice flowing over Baker's Saddle, 6,300 feet, is supported by the presence of sandstone blocks in the Copeland Valley from the same formation as Mount Cook. But as the main range near the footstool has some of the same rock, it is possible that these stones came from the divide between Stokes and that peak. Yet, as it has not been closely examined along there, it is hard to say. However, such a low depression as Baker's Saddle must, I think, have been an outlet for the ice of the central neve lying near the Mount Cook of that day. The third stream of ice from the supposed ice field went down the Landsborough helped by glaciers from the Hooker and present dividing range, but whether it discharged its water westward or eastwards, I will not presume to offer an opinion. There seem, however, good reasons for supposing that the former range at one time formed the watershed between the two coasts. The lake of which Dan Coiti informed me is a most interesting and picturesque little alpine tarn. It lies under Mount MacDonald on the seaward side of the ridge, and is half a mile long by two hundred yards across, draining into Jacob's River. I named it Roto Lake to Coiti, after the finder. There is no bar of moranic accumulations at the lower end, but it is one of those rock basins which is difficult to explain, except on the theory that it was excavated by a glacier. The rocks, smooth and ice-worn, descend precipitously into the water, which is apparently of great depth. Unfortunately, avalanche debris and a stream from MacDonald are gradually filling it up. The vegetation, flowers, grass, and scrub in this district is the same as elsewhere in our Alps. The mountain scrub on the eastern side of the dividing range is, where it grows, as dense as that of the west coast, but is found in such small quantities that it gives little trouble. The shrubs of which it is composed are all found on the west coast, and, so far as I could discover, there are only three mountain plants which do not grow on both sides of the range. The thorny wild Irishman, Dioscaria tomato, I have never seen on the west coast Alps, while in the Tasman Valley it grows with great luxuriance. The Nai Nai, said to be a heath and incense plant, a myrtle, of which I have found only two specimens, are both peculiar to the Westland Alps. The latter has a larger leaf, and the shrub is much smaller in size than the mountain musk, which flourishes on both sides of the Alps. 
The former I have already described in Chapter 5. While talking of plants, there is a very awkward sword grass, Asaphila colensoi, which we call the Spaniard. It has bayonet-shaped leaves two feet or more long, which will sometimes pierce the leather of a boot, and at all times, when one is going through the long snow grass, it will make its presence known in a most unpleasant and unmistakable manner. Without having made a complete collection of the numerous alpine flowers, it is of course impossible to say whether there are any peculiar to either side of the divide, but I am inclined to think that there is no difference in this respect. There are many flowering plants found on the Alps in Westland, which are not found, or at least are not common, in the Tasman district, but they flourish in other localities on the eastern side. The great majority of New Zealand alpine flowers are white. In fact, there are comparatively few colored ones. The most beautiful is the now well-known mountain lily, Ranunculus lyallii, which is the finest alpine flower I have seen in any country. Besides this, there are three or four kinds of ranunculus, some of which are bright yellow, and more plentiful on the western ranges than the eastern. Three or four kinds of daisies, or salmisias, are met with in great luxuriance, above 3,500 feet in Westland. The finest of these has a white flower, with a yellow center, and grows to three inches in diameter. Their broad, silvery green leaves are over a foot in length, and are pure white underneath. This white underleaf can be stripped off, and resembles thin white kid, and if it is twisted and knotted into a short string, it is almost unbreakable. I have found the stripping of one leaf strong enough, when rolled between my fingers, to stand the strain of as hard a pull as either Dick or I could give. The grass which grows on the Alps is coarse and long, but makes good pasturage, after it has been once burnt, though care has to be taken that it is not burnt in the wrong season, or it will never grow again. It only seeds once in three years, so far as I have observed. We call this snow grass the climber's friend, because it is absolutely safe to catch hold of when going over the Alp, and no ordinary weight or pull will uproot it. Edelmice, of a different kind to that growing in Switzerland, but very pretty, is to be found in great profusion from 3,000 to 6,000 feet above sea level, and several varieties of gentians are to be met with on the lower Alps. Douglas talks of an anemone, which he once saw, but we have never found any in flower while together. It is a brilliant yellow, and he says, as beautiful a plant as he has ever seen. However, not having myself found a specimen, it is difficult to say what it is, or whether it is peculiar to one locality only. I do not consider the subalpine flora of New Zealand equal, as a whole, to that of Switzerland, for though the Ranunculaceae and Salmisias are perhaps finer than anything on the Alps of Europe, the smaller plants are not so varied, plentiful, or brilliant. We never see an Alp here showing such a blaze of color as those in some parts of the European mountains. Taking the central portion of the southern Alps as a whole, I should say that vegetation ceases at 6,200 feet above sea level. Isolated instances are found of its reaching 6,600 feet, or even more. I have found a small patch of Edelweiss at 6,800 feet, and Douglas reports that he once found a, quote, single pale yellow anemone growing on a bare patch surrounded by snow at an altitude of nearly 8,000 feet, end quote. This, I think, must be considered too exceptional to take into account, and is probably only a seedling growing for that one season. However, it was not in the district now under consideration. Birds and insects are fairly plentiful in the high Alps, and I believe, in every case, are common to both sides of the range. The highest life that I have found, except the blowfly, Califera, which follows one everywhere, is a black weta, Hemidina, and a black butterfly, Peronodamon Pluto. The former has a body nearly an inch long, and delicate antennae, an inch and a half in length. I have found them walking or hopping over a snowfield some 8,500 feet above sea level on Mount de la Beche, and Mannering reports that he has found them still higher, on rocks where even lichens have ceased to exist. The black butterfly has a slow lazy flight at a high altitude, but when found on the lower glaciers it is as lively as most of its kind. Grasshoppers are plentiful on the grass, and also green lizards, nultinus, which grow to a considerable size. The commonest of all insects is the moraine spider. They are large black fellows, and are seen in hundreds on lateral moraines, and I have rarely found a patch of surface moraine, however isolated, without one spider living like Robinson Crusoe on his desert island. How a spider, 
could have found its way to a patch of moraine, surrounded by a mile at least of broken and crevassed ice, is difficult to say. And what he lives on when he has reached it is a still more difficult question. On the Franz Joseph, broken and crevassed as it is, we found numbers of these insects on the middle of the glacier far away from moraine. Douglas acknowledges the same difficulty in attempting to explain their presence in the midst of all these crevasses, but puts forward a few suggestions. Perhaps, he says, they have lost themselves. Perhaps they are practicing for a polar expedition, a sort of arachnida nasani. But the puzzle is, how do they cross these crevasses? Why do they not get their feet frozen? I dare say, while the sun is shining, they are comfortable enough, quietly freezing towards evening, and thawing out again next day to proceed on their journey. We saw no dead ones. When chased, they go tumbling down a deep crevasse, as if it was a haven of refuge for oppressed spiders. Whether they ever come back, I cannot say. While on this glacier, we found some small insects in the pools on the ice, near the icefall, which were black and about an eighth of an inch long. They took refuge in the minute cells in the ice. No doubt they were the larvae of some insect, but the pools would freeze solid every night, so I do not quite understand why their parents chose such cold quarters for them. Besides the kia, the only bird found in localities surrounded by ice and snow is the little mountain wren, Seneca Silvestris, a peculiar inquisitive little fellow with no tail and thinned comparatively long legs on which he hops from stone to stone or hummock to hummock on the ice, coming quite close to one, bowing and bobbing like a little machine. I have never seen him quiet for a moment. This bird always reminds me of a feathered walnut on two thin white sticks, about two inches long, which have a spring in them worked by clockwork. They are found everywhere in the high Alps and on the west coast, but for some hours before rain they collect in flocks and descend to the bush line, where they flutter about in company with the canaries, keeping up a bewildering chirping. When on Castle's Flat I saw a pretty little owl from three to four inches in height, it had strayed from its hole in the daylight, and was so dazzled that it made no attempt to escape. Rather foolishly, I did not shoot it, for it seemed a pity to kill so harmless and pretty a bird. Since returning to Christchurch, I have ascertained that though reports of such an owl have been made before, no specimen has ever been obtained. This, however, is not a dweller in high country. Owing to the very small allowance made by government for the work of exploration, we were unable to carry proper appliances and materials for collecting flowers and insects. Had we been allowed a larger party, there is no doubt that a most exhaustive collection could have been made during our wanderings over the Alps, and a most satisfactory description given of vegetable and insect life. I have only here attempted to put forward a general idea of the most interesting features in this direction. End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Seventeen: A Pass to the Hermitage. Instructions to go to the Hermitage. Forestalled. Meet Fitzgerald and Zurbriggen at last. Saltwater Creek. Pass to Tasman Glacier. A memorable meeting at the Hermitage. Solitary journey back to Copeland River. West Coast Work Discussed. Complete the Exploration of Copeland River. Returning from the hill to Scott's farm, I spent a few more days completing my map before sending it to headquarters, intending to start in a few days to inspect the range west of the footstool, with a view to taking a direct track to the Hermitage. This, as I have already stated, was the line I, and one or two others, had for some time past held to be the only likely route. It was direct and possessed grand scenery. But the government had required a route which should be, quote, free of snow and ice for three months every year, end quote, and therefore this was not acceptable. However, now that Douglas and I had proved, what many of us have known for years, that no such pass as required existed without going an unreasonable distance to the south, they at last made the best of a bad job and decided to inspect the Copeland again, Douglas having already reported on it in 1892. The evening before I was to leave Scott's house for the hermitage, Dick, who had been at the camp, arrived with two strangers, whom I at once recognized as Fitzgerald and Zurbriggen. They had just come over from the hermitage, by the very pass I was going to cross, and had forestalled me in the passage by a few days. However, 
I was glad they had come, and congratulated them on finding the pass, for though we have known of its existence, no one had crossed it. Note. See Appendix, Note 5. End of note. They seemed to have considered the river a very bad one to descend. This opinion of the character of the travelling is rather useful by way of comparison, because Douglas and I look on the Copeland River as an easy one for the West Coast, to descend, if taken the right way, and it fully bears out what I have already stated, namely, that what we call fair travelling is, to those unaccustomed to the work, really very bad. Fitzgerald said he made use of five languages to properly express his opinion of the rough going. I therefore calculate that he would have had to use at least ten if he had come down some of the other rivers, or else kept silence. It can well be imagined what a treat it was to spend a day or two with Fitzgerald, who was elected member of the Alpine Club on the same day as I was, and knew many of my friends in England. We had a long talk about Switzerland, England, and affairs in general. I was also anxious to have a talk with him about the good work he and his guide had been doing in New Zealand this season, and was pleased to hear that his enterprise had met with such well-deserved success. They had intended to go back by the Franz Joseph Glacier, but I dissuaded them, for I felt sure that so late in the year it would be impassable. Also, it would take two days to reach it. After some discussion, I suggested the route I had planned last year while on the Fox Glacier as an interesting one, namely, over the Bismarck Range to the Franz Joseph Neve, and thence over Graham's Saddle to the Tasman. Fitzgerald kindly pressed me to be his guest, and return with him, an invitation I most gladly accepted, chiefly for the pleasure of a week with them, and partly because it enabled me to share the first transinsular pass via Graham's saddle. I had a desire to cross this, for I had already been within an hour of it from both east and west, the actual pass having been left unfinished in the latter case, when easily in our reach, for reasons stated in Chapter 11. Sending Dick, therefore, up the Copeland River to Welcome Flats, some eight miles above its junction with the Karangarua, with a light camp and four weak stores, I left Scott's for the Fox Glacier, with Fitzgerald and Zurbriggen. My plan was to cross with them to the Tasman, perhaps ascend Mount Cook, and then return alone via the pass they came by, which I named Fitzgerald's Pass, to the Copeland River, joining Dick, who was to meet me at Welcome Flat in a fortnight with all the stores. We rode to Gillespie's Beach, crossing the Saltwater Creek and Cook River Ferry, and thence went up to Ryan's lower hut on Cook River, situated two miles nearer the sea than the hut which Douglas and I had made our base of operations the previous summer. There was no trouble in crossing the salt water, luckily, as the tide was out. This creek is one of the most dangerous to ford on the coast. It has since been bridged above the lagoon. Like most other streams, its course is, at times, blocked by a bar of gravel thrown up by the sea, and is easily crossable but it generally runs out amongst large stones and very deep, giving considerable trouble. The Maoris call it Ohinutamatia. This was the name of a woman who, according to the legend, was going with her two sons up on the outer range of hills for some purpose, when she fell ill and died on the grassy alp above the bush line. The two sons, being unable to bury her, made a heap of dry grass and burned her where she died. They then went over a ridge, following some tuis, which flew in front and guided them to a splendid valley full of wekas, where they lived in plenty for some time. On returning by the route they had gone, they discovered a spring of water rising on the spot where their mother had been burnt, and flowing down to the low country, formed the creek named Ohinu Tamatia, or sometimes spelt Owinitamatia. It is possible that these two natives crossed a spur of Ryan's Peak, and dropping into the Copeland River, reached Welcome Flats, for the Saltwater Creek flows from near this peak. As we had some thirty pounds each to carry, Fitzgerald brought Dan Coiti to carry his load, and we all rode up to a point a mile below the terminal face of the Fox Glacier, arriving there in somewhat heavy rain, and I was able to amuse my host and Sorbrigan by a little bit of bushcraft. We had no tent, and when it began to rain they were for returning to the hut, which would waste a day, but I showed them how to build a mai mai, or shelter of ferns and bark, like those I generally use, in which, with the help of a piece of Macintosh and a blanket, we spent two wet nights in perfect comfort. On Sunday, March 3rd, we reached the Chancellor Ridge, following my route of last year, and chose a stone at the lower end under which to camp. It was raining most of the evening, and snow set in at sundown, but we had a good though small shelter. Luckily, however, there was plenty of scrub, 
which burns green or dry, and I was able to boil the billy I had brought in my load, and we had a good hot brew of cocoa before we turned in. Douglas had given us a blanket, and I brought two of my own, which allowed us one apiece, and right glad we were of their warmth, when the sky cleared and a frost set in. About 2.30 a.m. we got up and kindled a fire, which enabled us to have two hot drinks of cocoa before starting. I was amused at Zurbriggen, because he did not know whether to praise the steaming cocoa or blame the delay caused by letting it cool. I suppose guides are always a little hard to please. Dan, by the way, had only brought up his load to the foot of the Chancellor Ridge, and then Fitzgerald sent him back to take the horses back to Scott's on the previous evening. As I had to return down the Copeland River and might be stuck by the floods, I carried one of my blankets over the pass with us. The others we left at the bivouac with the billy and half a flask of whiskey. They are still there. Leaving the sleeping place about four o'clock in the morning, we went up the Victoria Glacier towards the saddle into the Fritz Glacier, which I had found on the previous year, and on reaching the foot of the rise we roped. The ascent to the col gave no trouble, and from there Zurbriggen, who still rather underrated the broken nature of our glaciers, led us up the middle of the Fritz Neve. We soon found the Bergschrunz too bad, and had to return and ascend a ridge which bounded the Victoria Glacier. From this we crossed the top of the Fritz, and reaching a call leading into the head of the Blumenthal, a tributary of the Franz Josef Glacier. This saddle we named after Sir Bruggen. From here we could see the great neve of the latter glacier, and in front of us the spurs of the Bismarck Range stood out, separating the Melchior and Agassiz glaciers, also tributaries of the Franz Josef. Behind us the Waikukupa River, which drains the Fritz ice, was visible to the sea. It has no special features about it, being merely a straight, narrow valley, which would probably be a difficult one to ascend. Below, on the left, the fearfully broken ice of the Franz Josef gave Sorbriggen something to examine through the glasses. He acknowledged that it looked impassable, but would not commit himself from that height. On our right, Tasman's mighty shoulders and vast brown cliffs rose in all their glory from the Fox Neve, and to the south we could see over the country which Douglas and I had explored in 1894. Leaving the call after a short spell, we rounded the head of the Blumenthal Glacier and reached the spur dividing it from the Melchior. This had appeared to present no difficulty when I passed under it in September 1894, but now we found some little trouble in descending to the glacier below. No doubt the shortest way would have been round the base of the spur, which ended in a steep face of rock, but I had strongly opposed that route, as the lower ice of the Melchior is always very broken. So Brigan, however, soon found a feasible route down the rocks, and we descended to the Melchior Glacier. Everything was in our favor, clear day, hard snow, and easy walking. So it was fairly early when we reached the point to turn up to Graham's saddle. Had the snow been in the good order it was now, when I was on the Neve in September, we should have been on Graham's saddle in less than half an hour from where we had turned back. Unfortunately, we now made the mistake of spending an hour here melting some snow over a candle, for we were rather thirsty. So it was well after 5 p.m. when we mounted the ridge and overlooked the Tasman Glacier. What a glorious panorama of ice can be seen from here. I have twice before, in 1891, seen the same view when on De La Beche, and should never tire of seeing it again. The fog over the low country prevented a clear view westwards, but the Tasman could be seen sweeping down mile after mile to the terminal face, nearly fourteen miles away, drawing its supplies from innumerable icefalls and glaciers off the main range. De La Beche rose one thousand feet above us on the left, and the Rudolph Glacier flowed away from the saddle on which we were to join the Tasman four thousand feet below. Time, however, was precious if we intended to reach the Ball Hut that night so we could not delay on the pass. Hitherto I had been last on the rope, but knowing this slope of De La Beche only too well, we swung round and I took the lead, travelling as fast as the very hard snow would allow, down to and across the neve of the Rudolph Glacier. A short ascent of two hundred feet was here necessary, up a slope rather open to falling stones, but previous experience had showed me it was the only way, so we scrambled up the snow to some rocks, down which the descent was easy. Here we unroped, and after a short traverse to the left, got into an open couloir, and hurried down to some steeper rocks below. How different from the last occasions I had gone over these same rocks and snow slopes. Then 
I had twice a sick companion, and once a terrific storm. Now we had a clear still evening, and were all as fit as the proverbial fiddles. On nearing the bottom we found the rocks coated with ice, as it rapidly became dark. My poor old boots were not up to such slippery work at any speed. Therefore, before we knew where we were, it was dark, and we had to sit down on a ledge, five feet by two, and wait for dawn. Zurbriggen and I took the outside, so were unable to sleep, but Fitzgerald towards midnight had a little quiet, though uncomfortable dozing, as he sat between us with his knees under his chin. My two companions had dry socks and boots, but I had nothing, so put my feet into Zurbriggen's spare gloves and rucksack. We managed to make the latter angry during the night, and it took an hour to calm him down. They then tried to put my back up, so as to pass the time, but being prepared for it, I did not lose my temper. However, we spent another hour over the futile attempt. At midnight we sang some songs, ending up with the most appropriate one we could find, namely, we won't go home till morning. It was now rather cold, and my thermometer had fallen to twenty-five degrees Fahrenheit, which I endeavoured to explain to Zurbriggen was the cause of the cold. However, he seemed to have some settled notion in his head that the weather and temperature affected the instruments, and all my eloquence could not convince him that in New Zealand the instruments affected the weather. This occupied another hour, and then the cold was becoming troublesome, so I unpicked my blanket bag, which we had over our knees, and opened it to the full size of the blanket. This we put over our heads and tucked down behind us, making a rough tent. Each taking a candle, we held it between our feet and produced quite a warm current of air. It was very amusing to watch Fitzgerald. He would hold his candle and drop off to sleep. In a short time the candle would burn down and wake him up with a start as it scorched his fingers. Muttering some foreign lingo, he would lower his hand another two inches and again doze off with the same result. At last, the light of dawn appeared on the top of Cook, and we slowly untied ourselves from the various knots and twists, which invariably result from a long night on a small ledge. Nothing will persuade any of us that the sun did not for once in his life oversleep himself and rise an hour or two late. My boots were too hard frozen to put on, so I cut them open and made sandals of them, trusting that Adamson, at the Hermitage, would have an old pair to give me for my return to the west coast. Three hours easy walking took us to the ball hut, where we had breakfast and waited for Adamson, who was to meet Fitzgerald there by previous arrangement. About midday he arrived, and I returned with him in the evening to the Hermitage, where I spent the night, and obtaining from him two old boots, went back to the hut with a heavy load of provisions. For four days we stayed in that hut, waiting for a good day to ascend Cook, but it rained one day and snowed the next. Then Fitzgerald decided to give it up and go down to the Hermitage. I could not help contrasting the comfort of this hut and the convenience of the track with our difficulties in the past years. Yet from the way my two friends expressed themselves, I suppose it must even now be considered more than ordinarily rough. I know that, as compared with Zermatt and Grundewald, it is very uncivilized work even at the Hermitage. But is not the luxury at those two places rather too great? The pleasantest surprise of the whole trip awaited me at the Hermitage. When coming up to the hotel, I saw a visitor coming from the house, and said to Fitzgerald, Why, that must be Tuckett, but he's not out here. However, on getting nearer, I found that it was Mr. F. F. Tuckett, with whom I had spent some pleasant days in England, in 1892. It appears he had come up for two days to the Hermitage, and having heard I was on the west coast, never expected to see me, but curiously enough we both arrived on the same day. Nothing could have given me greater pleasure, and having introduced Fitzgerald to him, we three members of the Alpine Club sat down with a Swiss guide in the smoking room of the little Hermitage, and were soon over the seas to the other side of the world. It was a memorable occasion, for me at any rate, and the second pleasant ray of sunshine on my uncivilized life in the ranges. But it only lasted for one night, as he left for Christchurch next morning with Fitzgerald, driving his buggy to Fairley Creek, where the road meets the railway. Zurbriggen and I spent the twelfth in going for a short walk up the Hooker Glacier, and he showed me the whole of his and Fitzgerald's fine climb up Sefton. The evening was chiefly spent in discussing Mount Cook, for Zurbriggen was bent on the ascent, and I was anxious to accompany him. However, duty before pleasure is an universal rule, and I felt that my absence had already been too long, 
and that if I did not return at once, Dick might go down to Scott's and raise an alarm, justified by my non-appearance, for no one had ever crossed the range alone, as I proposed to do now. Sir Bruggen's very enticing proposal had therefore to be refused. On the 13th I left the Hermitage, alone, for the west coast, taking a loaf of bread, a billhook, and blanket, the same moment that Sir Brigan left with Adamson for Green's bivouac, namely at 6 a.m. The route lay up the Hooker Glacier for a mile or two, and then I crossed and took a spur about a mile further west than Fitzgerald and Sir Brigan ascended when they crossed. After some interesting climbing along a broken arete, I reached a small ice field which was steep and covered with fresh snow. It took me forty-five minutes to traverse, an awkward bergschrung having to be crossed before I reached the topmost rocks of the range. At 1 p.m. I topped the divide at a point about a mile west of Fitzgerald's saddle, and dropping down an ice-filled couloir on the Copeland side, I traversed round to inspect the pass. Leaving there at 2 p.m., I descended through the clouds to the valley of the Marchant Glacier and Douglas River. Though my route was to this point different to Fitzgerald's and Sir Brigand's, it presented, as far as I can gather, about the same amount of difficulty, excepting the fresh snow on the rocks and ice which I found, and the disadvantage naturally consequent on a man travelling alone. The two journeys, however, afford such good examples of the wrong and right mode of descending a west coast river, that I venture to quote the times taken on each occasion, and to describe shortly the best way of attacking this country, in hopes that I may be of service to climbers making a similar expedition. In future, these rivers must be attacked by others than Douglas and myself, so it is as well that the best mode of procedure should be known, for the work is unlike anything found in Switzerland, or on the eastern side of our Alps. Fitzgerald and Zurbriggen told me that they had left the Hermitage at 5 a.m., an earlier hour than I did, and bivouacked later, on the second day again started earlier, and at 4.30 p.m. reached Welcome Flats, and on the third day they made my camp below the junction of Copeland and Karangarua, about 6 p.m., reaching Scott's house after 9 p.m. that evening. I left the hermitage as stated, one hour later than they did, and travelled half an hour less, but managed to bivouac half a mile lower down the river on the first day than they, and on the second, though starting half an hour later, arrived at Welcome Flats by 8.45 a.m., instead of 4.30 p.m., or ten hours in advance of their time at this point. Judging by our trip down from here to Scott's, three weeks later, I could have reached his house by 10 p.m. on the second evening, that is in two days, instead of three, from the Hermitage. The reason of their longer times is to be found after reaching the grass line on the Copeland, for up to this point they were ahead of me, the natural result when two men are together above the snow line. On arriving at the grass they descended straight down to the river, and began to clamber over the great boulders, here and there meeting one which compelled them to go into the scrub. The scrub in this valley is not bad, for the west coast, that is to say, worse is to be found elsewhere. Here they would meet the usual tangle of stiff, unbreakable, and stunted vegetation, which would alone account for the use of the five languages they found necessary. In a short time they would again take to the riverbed, and have more hoisting on one another's shoulders, crawling under stones, and sliding down slippery boulders, followed by another deviation into scrub, and so on ad libitum, for, let us say, three or four miles. This would be succeeded by open travelling in long stretches of still more boulders, involving feats which would, to quote Fitzgerald, turn a gymnast's climber's hair grey. Considering that they took these difficulties on a face, as the diggers say, the times made by those two were good, but the pity of it is that it was all a waste of energy, owing to their having no means of ascertaining how to tackle this country. It is to prevent such a waste of time in the future that I am contrasting our experiences. On reaching the grass, the first thing to do was to have a good look at the valley. It was evident that there was no spur or ridge to follow above the scrub, but it was also evident that on reaching the second large creek, flowing down on the left, I could go up it for some two hundred feet, and reaching a piece of open grass, could skirt the scrub till another large open creek was reached, thus avoiding an evil-looking part of the river, which to a west coaster's eye meant mischief. The result was some fairly rough and tumble work in the river, a stiff but short ascent up an open creek bed, and good travelling for a short distance, to the next open creek, 
from which a view could be obtained round a bend in the river. There was, however, nothing to be done here, but descend and follow the river for nearly a mile, yet the time saved by the above deviation was probably more than two hours than one. From here I had to follow the same tactics as they pursued, and made the best of a bad job, until the inflow of the Strontian River, half a mile below my bivouac, was reached. Here it was at once evident that as the bush was composed of large rata trees, it would afford fairly open going. Therefore, by ascending one hundred feet from the river, and traversing along the hillside, I avoided endless work amongst large stones, and reached Welcome Flats in ten hours shorter time than they did. Below the flats, the same course has to be pursued, namely, go back from the river, because the valley is, here, for a short distance, as bad as Cook River, for large boulders. The Copeland is not, as I have already said, a bad river to descend, for there is no bluff, necessitating a high climb, like that described on the Landsborough and Cook Rivers, nor is there a bad gorge like the Karangarua and Callery Rivers. None of those rivers can be descended without high climbs. I do not think the route I took down the Copeland would account altogether for the shorter time. It was probably due to some extent to my being generally more accustomed to rough work than Fitzgerald and Surbriggan, but the method would be answerable for at least two-thirds of the difference in time. On arriving at Welcome Flat, I saw some footmarks, which showed me that Dick had been there, and a little bit of tracking along the gravel soon discovered the camp. Dick arrived in the evening, having been down for the last load of provisions, which he had left at a rock where he slept on his way up. I now had to traverse the Douglas River from the forks of the Copeland to the Marchant Glacier, as Douglas had not followed it to the head in 1892, because it was evident that no pass absolutely free of snow existed there. Thinking it possible that some party might come over the pass during the following summer, we spent some days blazing narrow tracks through the scrub, wherever the river compelled one to leave the open. These were marked, most plainly, with cross sticks. Note. Owing to my report that a track via this pass would be most expensive, I fear there is no immediate prospect of the government undertaking its formation. A considerable portion of such a track would have to be built up with solid masonry, as the rock is very rotten. End of note. It was the 29th of March, before we explored the Marchant Glacier, as there had been some very stormy and cold weather. A biting wind blew, and the thermometer never rose above 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and was constantly below 32 degrees, a low temperature for us, in our tattered and draughty clothes. The Copeland River has two main branches, the Douglas on the south, from the Marchant Glacier, and the main branch from the north, draining the Strontian Glacier. Douglas had visited the latter glacier in 1892, and as I wanted some photographs of it, we returned and camped on the 31st, half a mile below the forks. Here we sparred the river in order to get to the northern bank. This operation is generally fairly easy, but here it gave us considerable trouble. We found two large stones ten feet apart, between which the whole river had to pass, and hoisted a fifteen-foot spar of totra onto the top of one of them, intending to launch it over the gap. This, however, was difficult, for the stone we were on was narrow, and did not allow room to manipulate so large a piece of timber comfortably. Accordingly, we went two hundred yards down the river, to a place where a boulder of thirty feet in height overhung the river, and nearly met the branches of a tree on the opposite bank. After some slippery barefooted work, we got on to the top of this stone, and a gap of a few feet separated us from the branches, the river boiling and foaming past, thirty feet below. Dick went back down the stone, on the side away from the river, and there he secured himself, with the rope ready in case I fell, and I, with rope round my waist, made a spring of a few feet under the branches of the tree, and succeeded in reaching the opposite shore safely. We then adjourned to our spar, and with a rope and man at each end, launched it with ease, and were able to cross in comfort. Having agreed to bar fooling in camp, as my diary says, we went up the Strontian Glacier on All Fool's Day, but had bad luck with the fog, which only gave us isolated glimpses of the views of Cook and Stokes to the north, and Sefton to the east. After waiting three or four hours for the clouds to lift, we gave it up and returned to camp. On the second and third we journeyed down the river, completing some observations, and repitched our camp below the junction of the Copeland and Karangarua rivers, at the point where Dick had blazed a track up the spur of Ryan's Peak, 
which I had to ascend before returning to civilization. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter Eighteen Copeland River and General Work. Welcome Flats, Douglas River, Rua Reca, Strauchon Glacier, Decrease of Native Birds, First Ascent of Ryan's Peak, Return to Hokitika, Conditions of Our Work, Topographical Knowledge. Before describing our ascent of Ryan's Peak, I shall give an account of the Copeland Valley, which, like all others on this side of the divide, is of wonderful grandeur and bears many interesting traces of ancient glaciers. It does not equal the Twain and Karangarua in the latter respect, but for scenery it is in every way on a par with them. Before reaching Welcome Flats, for a short distance, some really bad and large boulders obstruct the valley and amongst these giants some beautiful glimpses of Mount Sefton and the footstool can be seen, with the great rata trees making an effective frame to the picture. Welcome Flats, some seven or eight miles up, form an ideal spot for a hotel. The surroundings would delight the heart of the most discontented tourist, provided, of course, that the cooking was good, for that seems to be a matter of greater importance to many than the scenery. Imagine for a moment an open, flat-bottomed basin, one mile, by half a mile, in the high ranges, at each end of which the valley narrows to such an extent that it appears to cease. The river flows down over a grey shingle bed, one hundred yards wide, and has grassy flats on each side for two hundred yards at the broadest place, with a terrace or two to vary the monotony of the level. Between the grass and the hillsides, another two hundred yards or so of flat ground is covered with luxuriant forest, which on the north bank grows up the spurs to a height of 3,500 feet above sea level, or 2,000 feet above the flat, and on the south side stops abruptly at the foot of towering grey precipices, which rise for 3,000 and 4,000 feet. These grand cliffs are cut into couloirs and gullies with wonderful effect, and their summit is serrated to a marvellous degree. Douglas waxes eloquent over this scene, and that should be good proof that it is of surpassing grandeur, because he has spent twenty years in traversing untrodden valleys containing glorious scenery. He likens the Sierras, as he named these cliffs, to a badly made saw. Quote, it looks as if some giant with little skill and a very bad file had attempted to make a saw out of the mountains. Other countries may show fine glaciers and higher mountains, but I doubt if anything finer than the Sierra exists out of the moon. End quote. Note. New Zealand Land and Survey Report, 1892-93, to page 43. End of note. I should not venture so far as the latter statement, for it is rather broad, but this part of the Karangarua Range will some day attract much attention. Between the various peaks a glimpse can be caught of snow, which is the upper portion of the Douglas Neve, and bears out what I stated in the last chapter of the slope on the south and the precipice on the north side of the ranges here. To the north, Mount Little towers up, with a fine ice field of the second order on its slopes, looking higher than it really is, owing to its isolated position. The view of the peak is flanked by high, dark green bush-covered hills, which enclose a dark and gloomy valley, down which the Ruera River flows, draining the glaciers off Little and Copeland Peaks. The snow line on these peaks must be only 5,000 feet. It is difficult to attempt a description of such scenery, and Welcome Flat includes all kinds. On the one side, beautiful alpine and snow-covered peaks. On the other, weird and awesome rock precipices, and in the midst, a peaceful valley, in which pigeons may be seen rocketing in the evenings, and the few birds left by the weasels and cats are as tame as usual. The Douglas River is more like the Upper Twain in its surroundings, not perhaps so fine in some respects, but still far grander than most places accessible to the ordinary traveller. Mount Sefton rises over 7,000 feet above the river, in bare rocky slopes and precipices, so steep that no glacier of any size can find a place. The Marchant Glacier at the head of the valley has fine surroundings, and owes part of its existence to avalanches from the cliffs above. Two good rock peaks on the north, which I named Unicorn and Dilemma, have one of those peculiar little glaciers, 
perched on a narrow ledge, so common in Westland, and due to a portion of the avalanche ice being caught in its downward career. The short, divergent banks range branches to the west, separating the Strontian and Martian glacier from near Ruareka Peak, which lies at the head of the valley. This peak we named after a Maori woman who was said to have found her way over to the east coast many years before New Zealand was colonized. She had some ornaments and tools made of greenstone, which is found largely on the west coast. The Naitahu tribe, by whom she was found, made her lead a party of warriors back over the range by her route. The invaders seized all the greenstone they could find, and many fights between them and the Natimamoi tribe took place, in which the latter were generally defeated. Te Urira, the chief of the defeated tribe, however, made a final stand at Taihoka, and endeavored to drive the invaders back, but was again compelled to give way. He then retired further south with a few faithful followers, taking his sacred mere, the badge of office, into the accessible mountains between the Otago Sounds and lakes, and there disappeared. Rumors of recent date point to the existence of this lost tribe even now, for fires are said to have been seen in the hills from the sea coast, but no reliable evidence of their survival has been found. Some of the Naitahu tribe settled on the west coast, and were in turn defeated by invaders from the North Island, who also left some of their number behind to intermarry with the vanquished tribe. My old friend Bill was descended from one of these North Island men, and had a South Island mother. The Marchant Glacier has five well-formed lateral moraines on the north side, one of which is very fine, having about 200 feet slope to the glacier on the south, and nearly 150 feet descent on the northern side, with an unbroken ridge of grass for some distance along the top. The whole of the trunk is covered with heavy debris, which gives the head of the valley a desolate appearance. Looking back, however, from a mile up the glacier, the cliffs of Mount Sefton, with slopes of scrub-covered debris at their base, look very imposing, and I very much doubt if such a grand series of rock precipices is to be found elsewhere in New Zealand. The southern end of the Strontian Valley is entirely blocked by a high moraine of 500 feet through which the river has cut a deep channel. Whether this bar has been formed by the present Strontian glacier alone, or by the old Marchant ice, is not clear. I am inclined to think that, to some extent, both are responsible for it. The ancient glacier in the Douglas Valley was once the largest and most important, and it is only because the surrounding hills are so steep and face the north that such a small remnant now remains. From the point we reached about two miles up the Strontian ice, which is completely moraine-covered, the view of Mount Cook over Baker's Saddle is as good as any I have seen of the peak. It is framed, as it were, by the 1,500-foot precipices of the Unicorn and 4,000 feet of sheer cliffs from Mount Stokes. I believe, from the glimpse I had of Stokes in the fog, that at one place a stone thrown out, say, 80 yards, would fall 4,000 feet without touching anything. The bluff was at the end of a short spur, which seemed to have been sliced down with a knife at the end, and the lower part of two sides, looking not unlike the buttressed and gabled end of a great cathedral, four thousand feet from roof to base. The avalanches off the western face of Stokes appeared to me, as to Douglas, to be swallowed up in their downward career by some gap in the mountainside. This we were able to account for after our visit up Cook's River, as already related. West of the Uruera River, which flows into Welcome Flat, Mount Little sends off a high spur, which encloses a large valley with Ryan's Peak. This valley is Architect Creek, and was evidently in the past occupied by a glacier. From the signs of ice action on the spur of Ryan's Peak, where I found two rows of boulders, suspiciously like old lateral moraines, it is possible that the Cook River Glacier sent a stream over the low saddle of 3,890 feet at the head of this valley. There are, however, few signs of ice action on this saddle, and I am inclined to disagree with Douglas on this point, and consider that the saddle was formed by constant denudation since the Great Glacier period. The Valley of Architect Creek, however, has at one time, no doubt, been filled to a great depth with ice, either a glacier originating from the peaks around, or from an overflow of Cook Glacier. The valley, however, must have been very much shallower at that time. Before leaving the Copeland River, let me give an example of the decrease of native birds in some of the valleys, due to weasels and cats. 
In Douglas's report, already quoted, he speaks of the gradual disappearance of birds in all valleys during the last few years, and continues to say that, quote, Welcome Flats put one in mind of the other days. It was swarming with birds. The kiwis were of larger size than usual. The wekas were large-sized, more like Otago or Canterbury birds. The robins ate out of one's hand. The bellbird sang its chorus in a style only now to be heard south of Jackson's Bay, while the blue ducks were as tame as of yore. With the exception of the kakapo, which I did not expect to see as I never saw one outside the mountain birch, every bush bird was represented on the flats. End quote. It is hard to believe that birds could disappear so quickly as they have in this valley. Compare Douglas's picture of peace and plenty with mine three years later. I should say that never, with the exception of Cook River and the Twain Valley, have I seen such a dearth of birds. Of kiwis, we neither saw nor heard a trace. Of wekas, we caught two and saw one. Dick says he heard one robin, which is more than I did. Bellbirds were either non-existent or silent. Of blue ducks, we saw one pair, so wild that we could not get near them. Whereas Douglas caught and shot some thirty wekas, and between twenty and thirty ducks for food on the river generally, and left hundreds, we only got three kakas, two pigeons, and two wekas, and instead of, like Douglas, finding too much to eat and having to leave stores behind rather than bring them out, we took more with us than he did, and yet were on short rations for two days. Douglas was the first man in this valley, and between his visit and ours, except Fitzgerald, who did not attempt to catch any, no man had been into these solitudes. The decrease must be entirely due to cats, and to a greater extent, to weasels. From our camp, at the foot of Ryan's Peak, we ascended by the track Dick had blazed, and at nearly four thousand feet reached the open grass. The scrub here grew to a higher altitude, as the hill faces the sea, and on the northwestern spurs I found the scrub at 4,500 feet, while on the southeastern side it did not reach much more than 3,500 feet above sea level. After traveling some hours, we reached a fair place for a bivouac overlooking the Architect and Copeland Valleys. Close to us was a remarkable rock, the Spike, which is a feature in this view from just below the Futa camp on the Karangarua and lies on the southern end of Ryan's Spur, just in the mountain scrub. It is a solitary column of rock, which has become detached from the rocky spur behind its present position, and, falling outwards, is now poised over the precipice into the Copeland Valley. This rock has a clear reach of fifty-eight feet overhanging the precipice, and is fifteen feet thick by sixteen feet in breadth, and has the appearance of a great gun mounted to command Regina Creek Valley, slightly elevated to drop a shell over the Karangarua Range. How far it goes back into the hill, or why it retains its position, is not clear, for it is on the brink of the precipice. Leaving our bivouac at 4 a.m., we traveled along a gently rising grass spur for two hours, by the light of a good moon, being able to see the mountains on our right like great specters in the moonlight, while on our left the flat country was under a low mist. The sun rose clear and bright about an hour before we reached the first or lower peak of the range some five thousand feet above sea level. Between this and the main peak, a narrow rock arete ran for a mile or more, too rotten and steep to tackle on the seaward side, and having too many awkward gendarmes to allow us to travel along the top. The side towards Architect Creek was smooth and sprinkled with snow, giving us some little trouble, for we had only one ice axe between us. Having traversed this slope, somewhat difficult in its present condition, for an hour, we reached a small glacier and found the snow in good order. Half an hour of steep walking over this brought us to the last rock, up which we scrambled without trouble. The peak is just under 7,000 feet and easy, but with the early winter snow on the steep rocks and with only one ice axe, it gave us an interesting climb. The last hour over the rocks and snow, combined with the most extensive panorama I have ever obtained of the great ranges, made Dick wish he had been with me the whole summer. He was convinced that there could hardly be a finer sport than exploring new country and putting in a climb at intervals. I can only say what we saw generally, for the effect of such a panorama of snow-clad peaks and glaciers, combined with deep valleys, flat country and sea, is difficult to describe even roughly. 
Alpine climbers who read this will sympathize with me, and at the same time picture the view to themselves. Those readers who have not climbed a peak above the snow line could never realize the glory of such a sight, even if described by the pen of a Ruskin. We could see the main range from Ellie de Beaumont to Mount Ward, a peak in the Landsborough Valley, the Hooker Range from Mount Monga to Mount Hooker, the whole of the Bismarck Range, Fox Neve, and Balfour Range were visible in the north. The offshoots of the Hooker Range faded away in the dim distance to the south, and Mount Little towered up like a miniature Matterhorn from the Stocky Hut across the valley of Architect Creek, to the bottom of which, 4,000 feet below, we could roll the loose stones from the peak. To the west, the low country with its moraine hills, lakes, and rivers could be seen from the Wataroa River to Bruce Bay, and within six miles the waves of the blue ocean rolling lazily shorewards, always four in number, for as one disappeared another formed, and though they appeared to be ever silently moving towards the beach, yet the number never changing gave them the appearance of still motion, if such a thing is possible. To the north, the Paparoa range by Greymouth was not only visible, but shows in the photograph I took from the peak a distance of 120 miles. The La Perouse glacier swept down into Cook River almost at our feet, on the north, in graceful curves, and the course of the Balfour River was open to no further question. The view from here proving that our previous conclusions respecting the Balfour and La Perouse glacier were correct in every point. After an hour or two on the peak, basking in the sun and meditating on many things, we returned leisurely to our bivouac and descended next morning to camp. We left our loads and went on to Scott's house. Here I stayed for a few days with Douglas and then returned to the camp to bring our things down. A severe gale blocked all the tracks, so I was delayed till after Easter, when I bid farewell to Douglas and rode up the coast for Hokitika, arriving there after four days riding. This ride is usually dull and tiresome after so much work, but it was varied this time by a ducking in Saltwater Creek, where I took the horse out of his depth. Douglas, having recovered somewhat, went south to the Waiatoto River, where he has a hut, and lives a hermit-like existence, far from civilization, amongst his beloved hills, and surrounded by undisturbed nature. The return to civilization was pleasant, after eight months away, of which only three weeks were spent in habitation, and for the remainder of which our mode of life is very well expressed, in the following extract from an article by Professor Ludwig Buchner on, quote, the origin of mankind, end quote. Quote, now it is the shelter of a tree, now an overhanging rock, now a cave that affords primitive man a suitable sleeping place, for during the day he hardly, if at all, needs a regular dwelling. At times rough shelters are built of bark or branches of trees, in bad weather, end quote. This describes our life during a great part of the season, with the exception that we had a piece of canvas always, generally a bat wing, but never a tent. The bat wing is really comfortable enough for all practical purposes, though I am perfectly aware very few would consider it fit shelter, even for a week. The hardest part of our life, as no doubt has been gathered from the foregoing pages, was the porterage of our provisions and other necessaries. This was very heavy work over such rough country, when enough stores for several weeks had to be carried by degrees up a river or glacier, together with instruments, field books, and cameras. It is a very different matter for a party out for a short holiday to go on small rations, sleep without any shelter, and so on, for they have an easy retreat to their starting point to which they can take a good camp on a pack horse. But let me ask any of those who have said, oh, we don't carry this or that, how they could care for a spell of seven or eight months with only one blanket, a fly, and batwing and as a rule only a spare shirt and socks by the way of a change of clothes. And this in a part of the country where it rains about three days in a week, and where flooded rivers have to be considered. I am sure a man requires solid food, and cannot rely on essences, extracts, and other such things entirely. And if this is true, then ipso facto his loads must be heavy when going on prolonged expeditions over rough, unknown country. I do not think that anyone, after trying a few months with us, would be inclined to take anything off our list of necessaries. They would soon come to the conclusion that several additions are needful to make life endurable. We had not the means to afford an army of porters, nor did the authorities provide for any additional help. Neither were we justified in rushing as fast as we could through the country, 
and saying we had explored it. The mountains, valleys, glaciers, and rivers had to be properly examined and mapped, with the branches and tributaries, that is, as well as it could be done with prismatic compasses. This was a matter of time, as has been seen. Hence, a goodly amount of stores was necessary, and therefore, again, loads were heavy. It is not intended to convey an impression that we thought the life hard, because we did not. Both Douglas and I loved the work, and accepted its hardships as a matter of course. I have only put forward a few arguments to meet the remarks which have been made in the past, and may be again in the future, to the effect that we carried unnecessary loads and lived unnecessarily roughly. It must be admitted that had we been able to obtain any cola biscuits, or any other food-saving invention, we could have avoided the spells of starvation up Cook River and in the Landsborough and Twain Valleys. When first I took up the work, I sent to England for cola biscuits, and any essence or extracts which might be serviceable. That was in 1893. Again, while in civilization during the winter of 1894, these things were sent for, but the orders were either never delivered or not attended to. They could not be obtained in the colony, so far as I could ascertain. Therefore, though we made a mistake in not having them, it was our misfortune, and not our fault. Photography had to be done under great disadvantages. I carried no tripod. My plates had to be packed for eighty to one hundred miles by the pack horse mail, and risked getting wet or broken. They were then left in some kindly digger's hut until required. They underwent very rough and tumble usage in the ranges, and after exposure were often deposited under a stone or some other shelter until we returned and could pick them up. They were then probably again left in the care of a digger or sent by packhorse to Hokitika, to be kept till I arrived and could develop them. Some of the valleys were so narrow and the mountains so high that many of the finest scenes, the Sierra for instance, could not be photographed unless by chance we made an ascent on the opposite side of the valley. The exploration of the Twain and Karangarua completed the general exploration and mapping of the central portion of the southern Alps for all the glaciers and valleys on the eastern side of the divide in this district had been explored by the end of the season, 1889-90, to 90, and the map completed the next year. So far as topographical knowledge is concerned, the information is very advanced. The Westland Survey Department has in its possession the trigonometrical heights and positions of every peak and call of the dividing range from Elie de Beaumont to south of Mount Sefton, with all the chief peaks of the divergent ranges. These were obtained years ago by the geodesical surveyor to the government from stations on the seacoast and lower hills. In addition to these observations, they have traverses by Douglas and myself of every river and all the principal glaciers in this part of the Alps, innumerable careful sketches, and some three hundred of my photographs from sundry points of vantage on both sides of the Alps, from which alone a map could be made approximately correct with the compass clinometer, and aneroid readings referring to them. Unfortunately, however, the government do not consider it of sufficient importance to bring out a complete and accurate map such as could be made from the above data. They have, in the geodesical surveyor, a careful worker, an enthusiast, and the very man to produce such a map, but for some time past he has been unable to devote his time and energies to a work which no one in New Zealand could do with equal success. Consequently, this wealth of information is lying perdu in the office safe, and we see very indifferent plans issued to travellers. The Royal Geographical Society published the best existing map of this district in January 1893 to illustrate a paper by me on the Southern Alps. Note. The Geographical Journal, Volume 1, page 32. End of note. That was prior to the Western Valleys and glaciers being explored, and our last two seasons' work has greatly altered its appearance. There may be still considerable minor detail work to be done in the district, and a theodolite will have to be taken over the ground, of which Douglas and I have made the reconnaissance surveys, but the whole country is now explored. Of peaks and passes, there are hundreds to be climbed, and these will always add minor details to an almost complete map. The worst of it is that it will be difficult to say exactly what will be valuable as new information in the future until the material in Hokitika is worked into shape. Though some of our best peaks have been climbed, the topographical information derived from the climbs is of little value, for the object of the expeditions seemed to be merely the ascent of the peak. 
the fact is that all the main topographical features have been settled by those who climbed and explored prior to 1891. Note. See Appendix. Note 6. End of note. And beyond the actual topping of peaks, little was left to be done on the eastern slopes of this district, and, excepting von Lindefeld's ascent of the Hochstetter Dome, the complete ascents of the higher peaks were not made till after that date, namely Cook, Tasman, Sefton, Haidinger, De La Beche, Darwin, Malterbrunn, the Silberhorn of Tasman, which is hardly a peak by itself, and Seely. The brunt of alpine work was borne by a handful of men climbing before 1892, and this is often forgotten. It is not right to contrast our unsuccessful ascents before that date with subsequent work, because we were learning the game, and those who came after us had the benefit of our experiences, and consequently saved a great deal of time and knew how to go to work. For men to attack such difficult country without guides or experience is very different from following an experienced leader. Though peaks were not scaled then, as they have been since, a great deal of necessarily hard work was done, and later comers do not always realize the benefits they derive from the gathered experience of the pioneers. The work of gathering topographical knowledge has to precede the ascent of peaks. The one may be called useful, the other ornamental. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Chapter 19. Glacier Observation. The Number and Area of the Chief Glaciers. Relation of Neve to Trunk. Are the glaciers advancing or retreating? Rates of Motion. The Tasman compared with Franz Joseph. The Future of the Southern Alps. When it is considered that glacier exploration and observation have only been taken up seriously in New Zealand during the last few years, we have every reason to be pleased with the amount of information already collected, more especially as there have only been two or three persons devoting their attention to the subject, the majority having spent their time in climbing peaks only. I assume that a glacier which descends from a neve to a point below the line of perpetual snow is of the, quote, first order, end quote. On this basis there are, within a radius of 17 miles from Mount Cook, or the central portion of the Southern Alps, 31 such glaciers, of which 25 are on the western and 6 on the eastern side of the dividing range. Note. Ice streams of the first order, which are tributaries of larger glaciers, have been included with the main glacier as one. End of note. Of these, Twenty are of a respectable size, sixteen on the west and four on the east, while the remaining eleven are of minor importance, and only hanging glaciers sending a tongue of ice down a gully below the snow line. Though few in number, the glaciers on the eastern side of the Alps are larger than those on the west, with two exceptions, because the valleys are fewer but longer. It is the number of offshoots and valleys on the west, descending to sea level in so short a distance, that make that country so hard to explore. In speaking of the eastern glaciers, within the above radius, I must rely on the figures given by Mr. T. N. Broderick. Note. New Zealand Alpine Journal, Volume 1, page 307. End of note. Who has alone made any systematic observation on the four larger glaciers in the Tasman district, and who has most kindly placed his results at my disposal. All his work has been done with a theodolite, and therefore may be depended on as accurate. The following are his figures, showing the areas and dimensions of these ice fields. Name, Tasman. Area of glacier in acres. 13,664. Area on which the neve now lies. 25,000. Length, 18 miles, zero chains. Average width, 1 mile, 15 chains. Greatest width, Two miles, fourteen chains. Name, Murchison. Area of glacier in acres, five thousand eight hundred. Area on which the neve now lies, fourteen thousand. Length, ten miles, seventy chains. Average width, zero miles, sixty-six point seven chains. Greatest width, one mile, five chains. Name, Muller. Area of glacier in acres, three thousand two hundred. Area on which the neve now lies, 7,740. Length, 8 miles, 0 chains. Average width, 
zero miles fifty chains greatest width zero miles sixty one chains name hooker area of lassier and acres two thousand four hundred and sixteen area on which the neve now lies four thousand one hundred and twelve length seven miles twenty five chains average width zero miles forty one point three chains greatest width zero miles fifty four chains of the many glaciers in westland there are only two larger than the muller and hooker namely the fox and franz joseph there are several others however over four miles in length as our work was only done with a prismatic compass i cannot put the results forward as more than approximate and have not attempted to ascertain the areas of supply and glacier ice this being the case i shall not commit myself by quoting more than a few figures and results the length of the fox glacier is nine and three quarters miles the franz joseph eight and one half miles the balfour six miles the mccaro five miles the strontian la perouse and spencer four and three quarter miles and the victoria glacier four and one quarter miles the douglas glacier has a trunk of three miles seventy chains and a neve running parallel to it of three miles twenty chains in length and therefore the whole glacier would exceed in area some of the above which have a greater length the horace walker also though only three miles sixty chains long receives ice from a large neve for about sixty chains along its side which would make it little less than the spencer in area it would be interesting to make some comparison between the relative proportions between neve and trunk in the case of perfect glaciers and disconnected glaciers one would imagine that given the same general altitude of surrounding ranges the trunk of a disconnected glacier would be smaller in proportion to its neve than in the case of one perfectly formed if we examine the proportions on various glaciers of neve to trunk we find it impossible to advance any rule as to the relation between the two areas the douglas glacier has a neve approximately three times the size of its trunk which is a larger proportion than that of all the other chief glaciers except the franz joseph and fox glaciers which have neves approximately five and three point five times as large as their trunks the supplies of the four glaciers in the tasman district based on the above table are one point eight two point four two point four and one point seven times as large respectively as their trunks the douglas glacier therefore shows an excess of neve such as would be expected but when the area of the balfour glacier is examined we find that its trunk exceeds its neve and is three times as large in area approximately of course in this instance the precipitous nature of the surrounding ranges does not admit of a large snowfield why therefore does the trunk of the balfour attain such a size it is larger than that of the douglas also both are shut in by precipices and covered with moraine the douglas has a peak from which to draw supplies one thousand one hundred feet lower than mount tasman and probably has a smaller snowfield to depend on but it has a large flat surface on which a large neve can find a resting place therefore it has better opportunities than the balfour of receiving sufficient supplies to enable a larger trunk to form in the valley however rapidity of descent in the valley bottom and many other facts have to be considered before a satisfactory answer can be given to the various questions which occur to anyone seeing these two glaciers everything favors a larger trunk glacier in the douglas than in the balfour it is higher above sea level has a larger neve and the relative positions of the two parts of the glacier are conducive to size but in spite of these facts we find that the douglas with a neve about six times as large as the balfour has a trunk only two-thirds the size i have assumed that the neve is the portion of the glacier well covered with snow at the end of the summer so that the trunk is practically limited to the quote, dry ice end quote. our observations on the glaciers are not of sufficient age yet to determine to what extent they are advancing or retreating in the tasman district reliable traverses which can be replotted at any time were made by mr broderick of the terminal faces of the tasman glacier in november eighteen ninety and the muller glacier in march eighteen eighty nine and november eighteen ninety this is all that has been done to determine advance or retreat and no other observations have been made to compare the present positions of the terminals nor can i ascertain that any cairns to estimate side shrinkage have been erected considering the number of climbers who have 
during the last three years, been in this district, it is a pity that a day or two was not spared from the rush after new ascents, for the purpose of putting up a few permanent marks. Personally, I have only been in this locality during the few days mentioned with Fitzgerald, since 1892, but as far as I could estimate, there appeared to be a distinct advance on one side of the terminal face of the Tasman Glacier. Owing, however, to the necessity of immediate return to my work on the west coast, I had no time to make closer examination, nor erect cairns. The Hooker River interferes to such an extent with the terminal of the Muller Glacier that it will never be easy to determine whether alterations are due to retreat or not. In the absence of fixed marks, and owing to the shortness of time since observations were commenced, it can only be said generally that to all appearances no change is taking place in any of the four large glaciers. Owing to the terminal faces, of the Fox and Franz Joseph being so easy to reach, and being in a district overrun by diggers, we can to some extent estimate the change from hearsay or old photographs, and further retreat or otherwise, can be measured from the cairns and marks which I have left in these two valleys. The Franz Joseph was, about the year 1867, according to an old photograph of the terminal face taken by Mr. Pringle, far in advance of its present position. The ice pushed its way, note, see the map in chapter 11, end of note, against the Fourgoche Moutonnet, and it was possible, so I hear from a digger, to touch it when on the top of the Sentinel Rock. The park and harbour rocks were covered, and apparently the Müller and Strauchen were half enveloped by the ice. I estimate that the glacier at that date was eighty or one hundred yards further in advance, and ten yards wider on the east bank, on the average, than in September 1894. There is evidence of this retreat on the rocky banks of the glacier on the east side, both at the terminal face and further up the valley. The rocks for some yards ahead of the ice, and for some feet above its present position, exhibit clean, newly rubbed surfaces of a lighter color than the rocks above. This at first misled me to expect a large winter advance, but it evidently testifies to a recent retreat all along the line. The positions of the cairns, which I have made for future reference, can be seen in Appendix Note 7. The Fox Glacier, as already stated, is moraine-covered at the terminal face for a few chains back, and therefore the changes would not be so rapid. It is narrow and uninteresting at this point. During our visit in 1894, our scientific ardor was damped by excessive rain, and when I was alone on the glacier, my unlucky mishaps prevented extra work. We have therefore only two marks, note, see appendix, note seven, end of note, at the terminal face for future reference. The moraine-covered ice here enabled many diggers to cross the river on the glacier, and we may gather to some extent the position of the snout in 1894, as compared with that of 25 years earlier. From these accounts I estimate that no change has taken place, a conclusion borne out by the fact that there are here no such marks of recently dressed surfaces of rock like that noticed on the Franz Joseph. At the terminal face there is a low dead moraine with some scrub growing on it, and the ice practically touches that now as it did twenty-five years ago. The surface moraine is evidently of great age, for there are several pieces of vegetation on it, some little distance from the actual snout. From hearsay evidence again, it is clear that some twenty years ago the Spencer Glacier in the Callery Valley descended into the river, the water washing against a face of ice, so the diggers say. In 1893, though not close enough to measure its exact distance from the river, I could see that it was at least a chain away. Thus, retreating seems to be going on here, while from all accounts the Burton has not altered its position. In summing up the results of my personal observation on these glaciers, it seems that while the Hooker, Müller, Burton, and Fox glaciers have undergone no change during the periods in which they have been known to us, the Spencer and Franz Joseph are retreating, and the Tasman to a slight degree advancing. On the other chief glaciers, the McCarrow, Marchant, Horace Walker, Balfour, Strauchon, Fetz, Douglas, Victoria, and Murchison, I could see no marked signs of recent change of position. The conclusion, therefore, if we may presume to draw one after such short knowledge, seems to be that at present the New Zealand glaciers are not receding to any appreciable extent. On the subject of glacier motion, we have some interesting figures, 
those of Mr. Broderick on the four glaciers of the Tasman district, and those of Douglas and myself on the Franz Joseph. As Mr. Broderick has been kind enough to place his at my disposal, I shall quote them in toto. Tasman Glacier, line one near the Ball Glacier, rods set on the 5th of December, 1890, and reset on the 7th January, 1891. Station one, total movement, 27.2 feet. Average daily rate, 9.9 .9 inches. Station two, total movement, 41 feet. Average daily rate, 14.9 inches. Station three, total movement, 47.7 feet. Average daily rate, 17.3 inches. Station four, total movement, 48.4 feet. Average daily rate, 17.6 inches. Station five, total movement, 49.6 feet. Average daily rate, 18 inches. Station six, total movement, 46.9 feet. Average daily rate, 17 inches. Station seven, total movement, 44.2 feet. Average daily rate, 16.1 inches. Station eight, total movement, 38.3 feet. Average daily rate, 13.9 inches. Line two, ranged from point of the Malterbrunn Spur, first set December 5th, 1890, and reset 7th January, 1891. Station two, total movement, 6.5 feet. Daily rate, 2.4 inches. Station three, total movement, 25.9 feet. Daily rate, 9.4 inches. Station four, total movement, 28.7 feet. Daily rate, 10.4 inches. Station five, total movement, 32.7 feet. Daily rate, 11.8 inches. Station six, total movement, 36.6 feet. Daily rate, 13.3 inches. Station seven, total movement, 33.7 feet. Daily rate, 12.2 inches. Station eight, total movement, 34.4 feet. Daily rate, 12.5 inches. Station nine, total movement, 29 feet. Daily rate, 10.5 inches. Station 10, total movement, 25.4 feet. Daily rate, 9.2 inches. Station 11, total movement, 13.9 feet. Daily rate, 5 inches. Murchison, line ranged from point above Dixon Glacier, set on December 29, 1890, reset 48 hours later. Station 78, total movement, 1 inch. Daily rate, 0.5 inches. Station 79, total movement, 7 inches. Daily rate, 3.5 inches. Station 80, total movement, 1 foot 4 inches. Daily rate, 8 inches. Station 81, total movement, 1 foot 5 and 1 half inches. Daily rate, 8.7 inches. Station 82, total movement, 1 foot 2 inches. Daily rate, 7 inches. Station 83, total movement, 9 inches. Daily rate, 4.5 inches. Station 92, total movement, 9.2 inches. Daily rate, 4.6 inches. Station 93, total movement, 5.2 inches. Daily rate, 2.6 inches. Hooker, line ranged at a point three quarter mile from the terminal face, set at noon on April 4th, 1889 and reset April 7th, 1889 at 8 a.m. Station one, total movement, 3.3 inches, daily rate, 1.1 inches. Station two, total movement, 8.2 inches, daily rate, 2.9 inches. Station three, total movement, 12 inches, daily rate, 4.2 inches. Station four, 15.4 inches, daily rate, 5.4 inches. Station five, total movement, 12.8 inches, daily rate, 4.5 inches. Muller, various marked stones first observed on the 29th March, 1889, and again on the 14th November, 1890, and 3rd December, 1893. Station one, 1889 to 1890, total movement, 239.3 feet, daily rate, 4.8 inches, 1890 to 1893, 
total movement 392.7 feet daily rate 4.2 inches station 2 1889 to 1890 total movement 271.7 daily rate 5.5 inches 1890 to 1893 total movement 371.4 feet daily rate 4.1 inches station 3 1890 to 1893 total movement 406.3 feet daily rate 4.4 inches station 4 total movement 262.6 feet daily rate 5.3 inches 1890 to 1893 total movement 424.8 feet daily rate 4.5 inches station 5 1889 to 1890 total movement 359.6 feet daily rate 7.3 inches 1890 to 1893 total movement 436.4 feet daily rate 4.7 inches station 6 1889 to 1890 total movement 398 feet daily rate 8 inches station 7 1889 to 1890 total movement 611 feet daily rate 12.3 inches station 8 1889 to 1890 total movement 506 feet daily rate 10.2 inches 1890 to 1893 total movement 889.2 feet daily rate 9.6 inches station 9 1889 to 1890 total movement 409 inches daily rate 8.2 inches total movement 409 feet daily rate 8.2 inches 1890 to 1893 total movement 557.5 feet daily rate 6.2 inches station 10 1889 to 1890 total movement 388.1 feet daily rate 7.1 inches station 11 1889 to 1890 total movement 146.1 feet daily rate 2.9 inches on the tasman murchison and hooker rods were carefully set and reset in lines across the glaciers the instrument used was a five inch theodolite Quote, a different method was adopted on the muller in order to show the direction as well as the velocity four trigonometrical stations were placed on the huge lateral moraines near the lower end of the glacier and they were then used as bases for determining trigonometrically the positions of the stones on the ice each stone had a number painted on it and every care taken in observing the great steadiness of the ice motion is a noticeable feature the stones have retained the same upright positions for nearly five years and the rods supported on them by piles of stones in 1889 were found there in 1893 end quote the original positions of the stones on the Muller Glacier must be stated, in order to draw any conclusions from their rate of motion. Number one is in the center of the glacier, 63 chains from the terminal. Number two is in the center of the glacier, 53 chains from the terminal. Number three is in the center of the glacier, 61 chains from the terminal. Number four is in the center of the glacier, 77 chains from the terminal. Number five is in the center of the glacier, 89 chains from the terminal number six is in the center of the glacier 107 chains from the terminal number seven is in the center of the glacier 122 chains from the terminal number eight is in the center of the glacier 145 chains from the terminal number nine is 10 chains from the south side and 122 chains from the terminal number 10 is two chains from the south side and 111 chains from the terminal number 11 is 11 chains from the south side and 48 chains from the terminal from these figures we see that the rate of motion is not constant for the stones had not traveled so far towards the terminal face as to account for the decreased motion in 1893 it is also evident that the winter flow must be very sluggish for the muller glacier has a greater fall per mile than the tasman and therefore at least as great a rate of motion would be expected it is evident that the lower average rate is due to the observations extending over winter as well as summer all the other measurements record summer motion only 
The only glacier measured on the west coast is the Franz Josef, the motion of which Douglas and I endeavoured to estimate in 1893. I put forward our results with some misgivings, for they are very startling. We placed a row of stakes along the ice, and reset the line again after the intervals mentioned in the table below. But though every care was used, the results can only be quoted as approximate, for a prismatic compass is not sufficiently accurate, and may be responsible for a considerable error in such observations. The figures, however, are just as likely to be under as over the mark, for it is impossible to say on which side the error would be, when it is considered that we could see with a naked eye the change in position of a mark on the ice after an interval of twenty-four hours. It is evident that the daily summer motion is very considerable. The side motion in the following table is accurate, for we had marks on ice and rock to check our results. Franz Joseph Line 1, Station 1, 7 days, total movement, 35 inches, daily rate, 5 inches, direction, magnetic, 320, remarks, 15 yards from north side. Line 1, Station 2, 20 days, total movement, 600 inches, daily rate, 30 inches, direction, magnetic, 335.3, remarks, about five chains north side. Line one, station three. Four days. 531 inches total movement. Daily rate, 132.75. Direction magnetic, 300. Line one, station four. Four days. Total movement, 408 inches. Daily rate, 102 inches. Direction magnetic, 352. Line one, station five. 4 days. Total movement, 212 inches. Daily rate, 53 inches. Direction, magnetic, 314. Line 1, station 6. No return. Line 2, station 1. 3 days. Total movement, 460 inches. Daily rate, 153.3 inches. Direction, magnetic, 286. Remarks, 8 chains from north side. Line 2, Station 2. 3 days. Total movement, 474 inches. Daily rate, 158 inches. Direction, magnetic, 308. Line 2, Station 3. 3 days. Total movement, 600 inches. Daily rate, 209 inches. Direction, magnetic, 285.3. Line 2, Station 4. Number of days, 3. Total movement, 621. Daily rate, 207. Direction, magnetic, 260.3. Line 2, station 5. Three days, crevasse opened, peg lost. Line 2, station 6. Three days, total movement, 71 inches. Daily rate, 23.6 inches. Direction, magnetic, 242.3. Remarks, six chains from the south side. Station, side motion by Arch Creek. Seven days. Total movement, 57 inches. Daily rate, 7.28 inches. Direction, magnetic, 335. Remarks, eight feet from north side. Line one was just above a small icefall, 90 chains from the terminal face, and was set on the 22nd November 1893. Line two was above another steep fall in the glacier, and at the foot of the great icefall, 190 chains from the terminal face. Peg number six shows that the motion is considerably checked by Cape Defiance, and that the ice is taking a direction towards Harper's Creek. The very rotten nature of the ice at the margin of the glacier prevented a nearer approach to either bank here. This line was set on November 23, 1893. The last station, by Arch Creek, was set on November 13, 1893, and checked by marks on the rocks. It was 43 chains from the terminal face. The above tables fully bear out the fact that a glacier moves faster in the center than at the sides, and also that the rate of motion decreases as the terminal face is approached. The actual influence of the tributary streams of ice on the motion of the main glacier cannot be decided from our observations. It would be interesting to set on foot a system of measurements 
from which to arrive at some comparison between the rate of flow of tributaries and that of the main glacier, and if possible follow the movement of the ice of the various streams after they have joined forces. For I presume that, though to all appearances these streams unite, yet they do not mingle, nor do they lose their individuality altogether. If this is true, it would add to our general knowledge on the subject to try and follow the individual streams after they meet. To draw satisfactory conclusions with regard to the rapidity with which a glacier flows at different angles of descent would be impossible from the above tables. Before any law can be laid down on the subject, much more complete measurements are necessary. The lines of pegs would have to be arranged at relative distances from the respective terminals. In the tables quoted, the rates of motion have been taken promiscuously, and only in two instances do the lines lie at all in similar positions as regards the terminal face. Reducing each glacier to 100 chains in length, we find by reducing the other figures that the lines of measurement were placed as follows. Tasman line 1, 36.1 chains from terminal. Tasman line 2, 26.3 chains from terminal. Hooker, 10.2 chains from terminal. Franz Joseph Line 1, 13 chains from terminal. Franz Joseph Line 2, 27.5 chains from terminal. This gives us two cases in which the rates of motion can be in any degree compared, namely Line 2 on the Tasman and Line 2 on the Franz Joseph. Assuming that the figures returned for the latter glacier are correct, we find that its maximum rate is rather more than 14 times as great as that of the former. This is a very startling difference until we examine the respective falls per mile of these two ice streams, which are as follows. Tasman. Total fall, 313.3 feet per mile. From Neve to Terminal, 187.7 feet per mile. Franz Joseph. Total fall, 941.1 feet per mile. From Neve to Terminal, 1,064 feet per mile. The latter glacier, therefore, has three times as great a total fall and nearly six times as great a fall per mile below the neve as the former. A series of careful observations, which would give us the motion of the tributary streams and their influence in retarding or helping the flow of the whole mass, together with systematic measurements in similar relative positions, combined with the average fall per mile, should give us considerable help in deciding the laws relating to glacier motion, the effect of obstructions in the valleys, and various other results which we cannot compute from our present observations. I have, in the case of the Tasman and Franz Joseph, merely set down the particulars, for they are the only two that can be compared from observations already taken. Someone may, perhaps, be able to draw satisfactory conclusions from the figures, which I fear I am unable to do. All these points of scientific interest can be determined in Europe with as great exactness as in the New Zealand Alps. But the great attraction of the latter is that besides being able to make satisfactory observations, the observer has the pleasure of several virgin peaks to ascend, and also can observe the effects of a low snow and ice line in a warm climate. There is far greater activity in the southern Alps than in the European, and therefore the effects of snow and ice are more marked and much more easily recorded. The avalanches are more frequent, falling night and day, than in Europe. The glaciers descend to a lower level, and the country is more shattered. Consequently, the action of snow and ice in altering the conformation of the country is going on to a greater and more noticeable extent. I do not know the Caucasus, but am well acquainted with Switzerland, and know Norway more or less. My comparison, therefore, only applies to the two latter countries. To a traveller seeking fine scenery, the southern Alps, especially the western side, offers a splendid field. I used to say that, below the snow line, New Zealand could not be compared with Switzerland. That was before I had been into the then unknown western ranges. I now say without hesitation that the southern Alps can not only be compared to, but in many cases exceed in grandeur, the scenery of Switzerland. The only thing lacking is the presence of human interest, for there are no picturesque peasants and chalets to give an added charm to the wild and glorious scenes met with at every turn. I often picture to myself a flood of tourists, overrunning New Zealand, as they overrun Switzerland and Norway, and imagine future developments resulting from such an influx. We should see, perhaps, a fine hotel or two on Welcome Flat, others on Castles Flat or at the head of the Twain. 
all of which localities far surpass many popular resorts in Europe in their attractions. However, may the day be far distant when hotels shall spring up like mushrooms in the glorious valleys of Westland, and the crack of the whip and clatter of wheels of Cobb and Co.'s royal mail coaches disturb their solitudes, and awake protesting echoes from their awe-inspiring cliffs and precipices. I do not wish these glories of nature to be hidden from travellers. Far from it, but should like to see a far-seeing government constructing a few horse tracks and huts in some localities, which Douglas or I can mention. A few hundred pounds a year less spent on experimental legislation would enable such tracks to be gradually made, and the localities thus rendered accessible would attract travellers who would benefit the colony far more than Acts of Parliament. Travellers, however, must not expect to view magnificent scenery without some trouble and a little discomfort in a young colony. But for all that, they should not be debarred from seeing the finest sights for want of a few tracks. If the foregoing pages induce any persons to make an attempt to visit the Southern Alps for pleasure, or in pursuit of science or adventure, and if they cause the authorities to value properly one of the finest assets in the wealth of the country, I shall feel that my work has produced some tangible result. End of chapter 19 Appendix of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand by Arthur Paul Harper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Timmerman Vaughan. Appendix. Note 1. Meteorological Conditions of the Southern Alps. Owing probably to the low altitude of the Fox and Franz Joseph glaciers, together with their bulk and rapid motion, it has been assumed that a great difference exists between the east and west sides of the Southern Alps in the matter of glaciation. Various theories have been put forward, and the meteorological conditions have been called into account for this peculiarity. The average rainfall at Hokitika is 126 inches a year, and at Christchurch only 25 inches. There is apparently a great difference between the insulation and radiation, and also the degree of moisture, on the one side and the other side of the island, on the seaboard. I do not pretend to be an authority on, or even to have attempted to study, meteorology, and do not put forward my opinions on the subject from that point of view. At the same time, I should like to point out a few facts regarding the rainfall and the glaciation of the Southern Alps, concerning both of which I am in as good a position as anyone to speak, for at present I have the honour to be the only person intimately acquainted with both sides of the High Alps. In the first place, until recorded observations prove that I am wrong, I believe that the rainfall in alpine districts near the dividing range is very little greater on the western slopes than on the eastern. My experience has been that the northwest wind, which brings the heaviest rain, is very nearly as wet for four or possibly five miles on the east as on the west. This region includes the greater proportion of the eastern glaciers, and it is within this area that the heaviest snowfall is found. Consequently, if I am correct in my premises, it follows that there is no reason why there should be a heavier snowfall or greater glaciation on the one side than on the other. Now comes the second point, namely, is there more snow and ice on the west coast than on the east? I submit that there is not. True, there are a greater number of separate glaciers, but they do not compare with the eastern glaciers in size. They are due not to a greater snowfall, but to a larger number of valleys. On the east coast, we find the great Tasman Glacier flowing for nearly 12 miles at the foot of the divide and receiving many tributaries. Supposing that, instead of flowing in this direction, there were spurs and divergent ranges jutting out at right angles to the main range from Ellie de Beaumont to Mount Dampier, what would be the result? Assume for the sake of argument that long spurs ran off at right angles from the former peak to La Beche, Conway, Haast, and Dampier. I contend that if the valleys enclosed by these spurs narrowed and descended rapidly, we should have a second Franz Joseph in the first named valley. The Rudolph would equal the Balfour, if not exceed it. The Haast Valley would contain a glacier little less in area than the Franz Joseph Glacier, and the Hochstetter ice would exceed the La Perouse Glacier. Examine other districts. The ice at the head of the Godley River far exceeds that on the western side. At the head of the Rakaia, 
the glaciers equal if not exceed those in the Wanganui River. On the Malterbrunn and Hooker Ranges, the chief glaciers lie on the eastern, not the western slopes. It may therefore be said that, even allowing the excess of rainfall on the western side of the southern Alps to be as great as has been assumed by those who have written on the subject, the difference in the matter of glaciation between the eastern and western sides of the dividing range is not great, and the preponderance of snow and ice does not lie on the west coast. I have stated above that I believe the rainfall, for five miles on each side of the dividing chain, is almost as great on the east as on the west but beyond this limit we find a great excess on the latter side, probably four and one-half times as great. Consequently, those glaciers which extend beyond that limit on the east reach the dry district, and those on the west are still within the wet region. Therefore, even if the glaciers on the former slopes descended in steep rock-bound valleys, their descent would not be quite so low or so rapid as those on the latter side because they would not have the assistance which a very warm and frequent rainfall on their trunks must give. But so far from the former descending in steep narrow valleys, they flow down over comparatively easy slopes, and yet reach a low altitude. To account, therefore, for the extraordinarily low position of the only two glaciers, which descend to very low altitudes on the west coast, we need not turn to meteorological conditions for a solution of the difficulty but only need to examine the formation of the country. For even allowing everything, steep valleys and climate, to aid them to reach a low altitude, we find that, with the exception of the Fox and Franz Joseph glaciers, the ice fields of the west coast do not reach such a low general altitude as those on the east. And the reason that these two are so very exceptional is that they have such large neves in proportion to their trunks, combined with the narrow and steep valleys. I have not intended to imply that meteorological conditions do not affect the glaciation of the southern Alps, but merely wish to point out a. that within the area of glaciation the difference between the meteorological conditions is not nearly so great as supposed, b. that the glaciation of the west coast is not greater than that of the east, c. that the altitude of the glaciers on the east is as a whole as low as, if not lower, than on the west, d that it is not necessary to turn to meteorological conditions to account for the difference in glaciation, if any, for that can be accounted for entirely by the conformation of the country. Note 2. Altitudes. In semi-official guidebooks to New Zealand, there are so many reckless statements with regard to the heights of the various peaks of the Southern Alps that it would be perhaps useful to give a list of the chief mountains. On page 123 of Brett's Handy Guide, we find Mount Aspiring given as, quote, the highest after Aorangi, Mount Cook, end quote, whereas it comes 20th on the list. In another place, the Hochstetter Dome is put down at 11,500 feet, and so on. Persons who take an interest in alpine matters and make annual excursions into the glacier districts ought to be free from such mistakes, but some are just as reckless. To give only two examples, I have seen an account of the ascent of Mount Ernslaw, in which it is called, quote, one of New Zealand's three great peaks, end quote. Its place on the list is 35th. In a description of an attempt to ascend Mount de la Beche, the narrator was within 1,000 feet of the summit and could see the upper part of the Tasman Glacier 7,000 feet below him. This peak is only 9,815 feet above sea level, and the upper portion of the Tasman Glacier is at this point upwards of 5,000 feet in height above the sea. A mistake, therefore, of over 3,000 feet was here made. These errors are often made by persons who should know at least the approximate heights. The emissions of units, tens, and hundreds would not matter, but there is little reason to quote such exceedingly round figures when naming the thousands. I could give many other instances. To avoid, if possible, the repetition of such mistakes in the future, the following list of the peaks over 9,000 feet is given with a few additional points of interest. Most of the figures are exact, and the rest are subject to very trifling alteration when new values are worked out from recent completed observations. I have confined myself to the central district, only given one or two peaks outside. These are marked asterisk. Mount Cook, 1, 12,349 feet. Mount Cook, 2, 12,173 feet. Mount Cook, 3, 
11,844 feet. Tasman, 11,475 feet. Dampier, Hector, 11,323 feet. Lendenfelt, 10,551 feet. Silberhorn, 10,500 feet. Maltebrun, 10,421 feet. Hicks, David's Dome, 10,410 feet. Sefton, 10,359 feet. Ellie de Beaumont, 10,200 feet. Hadinger, 10,107 feet. Stokes, La Perouse, 10,101 feet. The Horn, 10,063 feet. The Minarets, 10,058 feet. Stokes Lower Peak, 10,034 feet. The Minarets Lower Peak, 10,022 feet. Glacier Peak, 10,017 feet. Wolsack Peak, 9,968 feet. Asterisk Aspiring, 9,960 feet. Hackle Peak, 9,949 feet. Hamilton, 9,915 feet. Host, 9,835 feet. De La Beche, 9,815 feet. Cook, Fourth Peak, 9,716 feet. Darwin, 9,715 feet. Peak near Darwin, 9,607 feet. Conway's Peak, 9,511 feet. Green, 9,325 feet. Hutton, 9,297 feet. Hochstetter Dome, 9,258 feet. Lower Peak, 9,179 feet. Asterisk, Aerosmith, 9,171 feet. Spencer, 9,167 feet. Asterisk, Ernslaw, 9,165 feet. Peak near Darwin, 9,144 feet. Footstool, 9,079 feet. Kronprinz Rudolf Peak, 9,039 feet. Dwarf, 9,025 feet. Graham's Saddle, 8,739 feet. Minaret's Saddle, 9,620 feet. Lindenvelt Saddle, 7,991 feet. Harper's Saddle, 8,580 feet. Baker's Saddle, 6,300 feet. Wall Pass, 7,426 feet. Ball Hut, approximately 3,700 feet. De La Beche Bivouac, 4,782 feet. Green's Bivouac, approximately 6,780 feet. Terminal Face Murchison, 3,452 feet. Terminal Face Tasman, 2,354 feet. Terminal Face Hooker, 2,852 feet. Terminal Face Muller, 2,516 feet. Terminal face Fox, aneuroid, 670 feet. Terminal face Franz Joseph, 692 feet. Terminal face Victoria, aneuroid, 3,685 feet. Terminal face Balfour, 2,300 feet. Terminal face Douglas, 3,663 feet. Terminal face Horace Walker, 3,511 feet. Terminal face McCarrow, 4,096 feet. Terminal face Fetz, 2,950 feet. Karangarua Pass, 5,641 feet. Douglas Pass, 6,115 feet. In addition to the above peaks, there are one or two more on the main chain outside this district. Tapuanuku in the Kaikoura Ranges and Ruapehu, an extinct volcano in the North Island, above 9,000 feet besides hundreds of fine peaks of over 8,000 feet in the Southern Alps. Note 3. Black Swans These birds are natives of the Australian continent, and were introduced many years ago into New Zealand by private individuals. They have since then increased enormously, and are to be found in thousands on our lakes and lagoons. I'm not sure whether they were brought over to the West Coast or found their way unaided, but it was not until the early 70s that they first became established on this side of the South Island. Three or four pairs settled themselves on the large lagoon at Ocarito, and, unaccustomed to the heavy and frequent floods which occur in the spring, they built their nests too near the water, and for two or three consecutive seasons were flooded out, and lost their eggs. 
After having shown no signs of increase for three years, they apparently decided to change their usual mode of procedure. Instead of building their nests out of reach of high floods, they still remained close to the water's edge, but got over the difficulty by erecting huge heaps of rushes and dry sticks, so constructed that when the floods came they floated on the surface of the water. Consequently, the female birds could remain sitting on the eggs, in spite of a general rise in the level of the lagoon, and on the flood subsiding, they were again safely stranded on dry land. Since this method was adopted, it has become the general practice for black swans on the west coast to construct floating nests, and they now never lose their eggs in floods. Whether the swans in other parts of the colony follow this rule or not, I do not know, but it certainly took them three years to discover this mode of avoiding floods on the west coast. I was told of it by a man who is a keen naturalist, and who observed the whole proceeding, from their first appearance to their adoption of the new plan. Note 4. Mount Egmont. In company with Mr. C. Wiggins and my brother, R. T. Harper, I made the ascent of Mount Egmont in December 1895, and was interested to find so much similarity between the vegetation on the peak and that on the southern Alps. Egmont, Taranaki as the Maoris call it, is an extinct volcano of 8,260 feet in the North Island, and rises from a practically level plain of 200 feet above sea level. It is the most perfect cone that it is possible to conceive. Egmont has been said by persons who have seen both to rival Fusiyama of Japan. From a mountaineering point of view, it is only a very steep walk, no hand and foot climbing being necessary, and there are in the summer well-beaten tracks to the summit. When we went up, it was coated with snow, from 6,300 feet to the top, and consequently we had a much less tedious walk than it would have been when the loose scoria is uncovered. However, curiously enough, an ascent with much snow on the peak is rarely, if ever, made. Nearly all expeditions are postponed till the peak has put off his winter garb. In spite of the height above sea level, there was no sign of glacier ice, and though in accounts of climbs which are constantly appearing, we see the mention of glaciers, notably the, quote, Chadwick Glacier, end quote. It is erroneous to suppose that glacier ice exists. There are several hard snow patches all through the summer, but no more. When snow is on the peak, there is necessarily a certain amount of ice or frozen snow, in which a step or two have to be cut, and this has given rise probably to the idea concerning glaciers. The interesting feature to me in the climb was that from 4,000 feet, a low, dense alpine scrub was found, extending up to about 5,000 feet above sea level. This grew to 15 feet in height at the lower limit, and gradually became dwarfed to 2 feet at the upper level. In nearly every respect it is the same as that on the southern Alps. With the exception of the Nainai, I saw all the other chief shrubs. Above this the grass and alpine flowers were found, very poor in variety and size. However, the few varieties seen were also to be found on the southern Alps. The transplanting of the ranunculus lyallii, Selmisias, and Edelweiss would no doubt be simple and meet with success. The reason why I was surprised at the presence of this vegetation is that Egmont is isolated. The nearest mountain which attains an altitude sufficiently high to carry subalpine vegetation is Ruapehu, 9,167 feet and it is 80 miles away as the crow flies, and with Mount Tongariro and Narahoe is probably the only peak besides Egmont on which such vegetation could be found in the North Island. In any case, it is the nearest mountain to Egmont of sufficient altitude. Narahoe, 7,376 feet, is still an active volcano, but Tongariro, 6,500 feet, and Ruapehu are extinct. The latter has a hot crater lake, surrounded by perpetual ice, which by its melting feeds the lake. Accounts of this peak are to be found in the Proceedings of the Royal Geographical Society, 1885, page 272, also New Zealand Lands and Survey Reports of the years 1893-4 to and 1894-5. to Note 5. Fitzgerald's Pass and C. E. Douglas. It is a remarkable instance of the truth of the old proverb, quote, a prophet is not without honor save in his own country, end quote, that when Mr. Fitzgerald and Sir Brigham went over the range from the Hermitage to the West Coast, the Christchurch and other newspapers wrote articles on the discovery, 
stating that it was a notable fact that Mr. Douglas had been for some years looking for a pass to the Hermitage and had been unsuccessful, though he had actually been up this very river, the Copeland, and that Mr. Fitzgerald, who had only been in the colony for a few weeks, had been able to do that which had beaten the government explorer. The latter stated in the Alpine Journal of August, 1895, that parties had tried to find a pass, but had been unsuccessful, and therefore he himself decided to undertake the task. Both these observations are most unjust, because the instructions Douglas had were to find some saddle, quote, free of snow and ice, for three months every year, end quote, in order to allow a track to be taken to the Hermitage from the west coast. There had been numbers of passes made since 1857 from coast to coast, but they were either not in the Hermitage district or did not fulfill this condition. Fitzgerald's pass itself does not fulfill the requirements of the government and should never have been noticed as valuable in that respect, though it is so in others. No doubt a track could be taken over it, and it will have to be accepted as the best and only route in the course of time. Douglas stated in his report, which he made with a map in 1892, a map used by both Fitzgerald and myself in our journeys down the Copeland, that he found a high saddle fairly free of snow. But as it would not be free for the period required by government, he did not ascend or cross it. The observation, therefore, was made recklessly, and without any inquiry into the real instructions or requirements of the government. To anyone who knows Douglas and his work in the past, the idea that he could not force a way over a pass of this kind is absurd, for no one has done such good work as he has in the New Zealand Alps. To give more than a bare record of his explorations would be impossible, for he began traversing and exploring the rivers of South Westland in 1874 and continued with few interruptions until November 1895, when he had to leave me in the Karangarua River. The full records of his work are in the survey office at Hokitika, and as space will not allow me to enter into details, it will be sufficient to enumerate shortly the actual rivers explored by him, taking them in their order of position, not of date. In 1884, Douglas explored the Arawata River, at the head of which is the Grand Alpine District of the Aspiring Group, several fine summits rising between 8,000 and 10,000 feet above sea level. From an Alpine point of view, they are untouched, for Douglas did not go above the snow line, except in the case of the Bonar, a fine disconnected glacier, similar, though far smaller, than the Douglas up the Twain River. The Waipara River drains the ice field and flows into the Arawata. The Waiatoto River, coming from the ranges near Castor and Pollux, two fine peaks of nearly 9,000 feet, he has traversed to its head. It drains the Therma and Pickelhaub glaciers, the former of which he went up. He describes it as being walled in, like the Balfour, by wonderful terraces and cliffs of rock, rising sheer for 2,000 feet, one of the most striking scenes he has witnessed. The ice lines are in this valley most marked, and the rocks polished and grooved in a very noticeable manner. In fact, Douglas constantly refers to the head of these two rivers as containing some of the grandest and most magnificent scenery he knows, and it is not very difficult to reach. If it exceeds in grandeur the country he and I have seen together, I can only say it must be very wonderful. He twice reached the summit of the dividing range here, low saddles, to Otago being the rule. The Okura River is another draining divide, and was explored by Douglas. It has a low pass at the head, which he crossed, the Actor Pass, and which is accessible for a horse on the eastern side. The Landsborough River, the longest on the west coast, was first explored and traversed by a party led by Douglas. Particulars of this river can be seen in the previous chapter. Going further north, we come to the Paringa River, with its tributary the Otoko, and the Copeland River, which, with the Turnbull, Cascade, and Maitahi Rivers, were all explored, mapped, and reported on by him. The Turnbull and Cascade should have been mentioned earlier, as they lie away south. His work in conjunction with me has already been chronicled, and had the above explorations been recorded as fully, we should have at least three volumes of the same size as this. His reports are voluminous and most interesting. He has a quaint, amusing style of describing the natural features of the country, which are, however, most faithfully recorded, and the theories advanced are valuable. Unfortunately, I cannot persuade him to write an account of his work, it is no use to tell him he ought not to keep such interesting matter to himself. 
Had I time to look over his diaries and reports, I could, with help, produce a very thorough and valuable record of this southern country. But I am not a man of leisure, and the diaries are in the safe of a government department. As a naturalist and explorer, Douglas has had few equals in New Zealand. No amount of hardship or difficulty deterred him from his purpose. He was painstaking and accurate in his reports. He has explored chiefly from love of such work, and only recently received aid from the government. He never exaggerated his difficulties or the results of the expedition. He never attempted to take credit for a single thing which he had not done. He always allowed his companion, when he had one, a full share in the honor of the exploration, and never tried to add to his own credit by deprecating the work of others. In fact, he is, in my opinion, an ideal explorer. A vast deal of his traveling was done alone, with only a dog for company. He carried little until the gradual disappearance of birds compelled him to increase his loads. Douglas says he does not believe in a man unless he has a petty vice, and that is the reason, I suppose, why he allows the virtue of modesty to become almost a vice. These notes concerning him are written without his knowledge, for I feared to risk a refusal if I asked his leave. I have taken the responsibility because I feel that a man who has done what he has in the past, and who is too worn out to do much more, ought not to be allowed to hide his light under a bushel. It is of public interest, to New Zealanders at any rate, that he should be known as a great explorer. Many who have done work of a hundred times less importance are well known in the colony, and some who have done far less in other parts of the world with all the advantages of porters, guides, and other luxuries, are of worldwide renown, while for the want of a few words Douglas remains unknown, save to a small circle, even in New Zealand. Had he written or lectured on his work, he would have ere now received honours from learned societies as a naturalist and explorer. I trust he will forgive me for dragging him before the public from his remote corner of Westland, and hope he will look upon my action in so doing as evidence of the great admiration I have for his past work. Note 6. Early Explorations The names of those whose work has materially advanced our knowledge of the topographical features of the central portion of the Southern Alps should be recorded. On the East Coast in 1862, Sir Julius von Haast made the first recorded exploration into the Tasman district. In 1867 and 1870, Mr. E. P. Seely photographed and explored the Tasman Hooker and Müller to their upper basins, also the Godley and Classen glaciers at the head of the Tekapo River. In 1882, the Reverend W. S. Green practically ascended Mount Cook, and his climb should be considered the first real ascent. Beyond information respecting the eastern slopes of that peak, his climb was not of topographical importance. In 1883, Dr. von Lindenfeld made a survey with some rather bad errors owing to a faulty theodolite of the Tasman Glacier. In 1889-90-91, Mr. T. N. Broderick completed the survey of the eastern glaciers, including the Godley and Classen on the Tekapo River. In 1890, Messrs. G. E. Mannering, M. Hamilton, and I made the first exploration of the Murchison Glacier and Valley, as already related. In the same year, Messrs. G. E. Mannering and M. Dixon, on Mount Cook, and R. Blackiston and I on Harper's Settle, confirmed the fact that Mount Cook did not lie on the dividing range. On the west coast in the 70s, the geodesical surveyor carried a triangulation down the coast, fixing all the high peaks. And between 1892 and 1895, Douglas and I explored, as related in the foregoing pages, all the valleys and glaciers of Westland in this district. Thus, with the one exception of the Tasman Glacier, the exploration of this district, both east and west, has been carried out by the enterprise of New Zealanders. It remains to be seen when and by whom the alpine exploration of other districts, named in Chapter 1, will be completed. Let us hope that New Zealanders will not allow the credit of that work to be taken from them by visitors from other countries, and that they will hold their own in the matter of climbing peaks as well. Note 7. Measurement Cairns and Photographs for Reference While on the Franz Josef I placed some cairns on the eastern bank of the glacier, and for sake of reference, while there, distinguished them with letters of the alphabet, with the letter M prefixed to avoid confusion with other survey stations. These are in brackets in the following table, and the cairns are numbered from the terminal face upwards. 
Kiern 1, MF. Distance from nearest ice, 39 feet. Height above the edge of glacier, 25 feet. Date, 19th September, 1894. Cairn 2, M.E. Distance from nearest ice, 48 feet. Height above the edge of glacier, 20 feet. Date, September 19th, 1894. Cairn 3, M.D. Distance from nearest ice. Photograph Cairn. Height above the edge of glacier. See below. Date, September 19th, 1894. Cairn 4, M. Distance from nearest ice, 198 feet. Height above the edge of glacier, 70 feet. Date, September 16th, 1894. Cairn 5, M.A. Distance from nearest ice, 23 feet. Height above edge of glacier, 15 feet. Date, September 16th, 1894. Cairn 6, M.B. Distance from nearest ice, 111 feet. Height above the edge of glacier, 40 feet. Date, September 16th, 1894. Cairn 7, M.C. Distance from nearest ice, 30 feet. Height above the edge of glacier, 20 feet. Date, September 16th, 1894. The first two are on the south and north banks of Arch and Rope Creeks, respectively. Number three is on the north bank of a small creek reached after passing Rope Creek. Number four is some 18 chains south of number two, on the line of stones forming a remnant of lateral moraine. Number five is on the south bank of a deep gorge, about 30 chains south of Rope Creek, on a large hummock of rock. Number six is about four chains south, and 50 feet below a large erratic block on the lateral line of stones, just before reaching the rocky cape, E on the map. And number seven is on a knob of rock, south of the last small creek, immediately below the said point E. In December 1893, number four was the only cairn erected, and was 209 feet away from the ice, according to a note I have from Douglas. There is some error in this figure, because the ice had not noticeably retreated, and not advanced, in September 1894. For future visitors, I may mention that Arch Creek is the deep gorge at the mouth of which an isolated Roche Moutonnet stands, and Rope Creek is a large stream flowing in a shallower gorge, some twenty chains south of the former. The edge of the glacier mentioned in the third column is the point at which the ice meets the rock. The cairns are heaps of stones of two and three feet high, on the bare, ice-worn bank, and easily seen. The only other mark we have is a plus on the back of the sentinel rock, about four feet from the ground and two chains from the western end. But I fear it will not be easily found except by us, for it has weathered a great deal. The paint, which should have been sent to the Franz Joseph, went on to Gillespie's, and we were unable to use it. This plus I have already mentioned in Chapter 11, also the general retreat visible on my second visit. Photographs from the Sentinel Rock, looking east. From the Barren Rock, showing the contact of ice and rock at the outlet on the eastern bank. From the point at which the horse track descends onto the gravel flat, showing the whole terminal face. From cairn number three, in the above table, looking south, to show the encroachment of the ice on the rock bank. And from cairn six, looking towards point E, can be compared with similar photographs taken by me and in possession of the Alpine Club Glacier Committee. Unfortunately, a dozen or more taken in September 1894, especially for the purpose of comparison, were lost when my load went out to sea on the way to Gillespie's. On the Fox Glacier, owing to mishaps and general bad luck, we only built two cairns. One of these is on a small terminal moraine, between the fringe of scrub and the ice, right at the terminal face. This was on April 4, 1894, distant 43 yards from the ice, in a direction of 96 degrees 30 minutes, magnetic, and lines drawn at 150 degrees 30 minutes to the south, and 25 degrees 30 minutes to the north, touch the furthest advance of ice on each side. On the north side of the terminal face, the ice touches the rocky hillside, until within eight chains of the actual terminal, and then it leaves the rock and continues to the snout at a distance of ten to thirty yards from the hillside. On the southern side we erected a cairn on a ledge at the foot of the cone rock, which ought easily to be found. On April 25, 1894, at a bearing of 355 magnetic, the ice was 37 yards distant. Photographs should be taken from a stone in the large creek, which joins the river here, 
about one chain from its inflow into the river, looking north to show the terminal, and east to show the encroachment of the ice, on the side of the Cone Rock. Photographs also showing the position of the ice on the various rocky capes on the north side of the valley can be compared with those I have taken. The only other Westland glacier which has any special interest for future observation is the Douglas. I think a series of photographs of the Neve would be valuable to show whether it is gaining, losing, or stationary. A picture taken from Douglas Pass, or the lateral moraine just below the northern end of the gravel flat, would show any alteration if compared with those I have taken. Unfortunately, I had too much to do when in the Twain Valley to spend time over erecting cairns, for the work done there occupied about twelve hours each day, and as I was working alone it was quite enough to do without even an additional hour or two to fix cairns. It would, however, be a most interesting thing to compare the rate of increase or decrease of the trunk with that of the neve, for there must be some law of relation between the bulk of the supply and the glacier ice, and this may help, a little at least, towards its discovery. These marks, and suggestions as to photographs, have here been recorded in hopes that someone, in the future, may make fresh measurements for comparisons. The two first-name glaciers may expect many visitors, for they are easily reached, but the Douglas is too remote to have much attention paid it for many years. The Franz Joseph, however, is the most likely of the three to attract visitors, for it has a horse track to its terminal. I therefore made a point of placing the various cairns along its side. In the interests of glacier science, it is to be hoped that some visitor will check the position of the ice and send the results, with photographs, to the Alpine Club London. Everyone should remember that any measurement or photograph, however insignificant, is of value, which shows the position of the ice with regard to some conspicuous object. We may not realize the value of such ourselves, but those investigating the laws of glacier motion and action in the Alpine Club Committee can put forward theories if we send them facts. Surely it is worthwhile to devote a day to such useful work, instead of spending the whole time in scaling peaks and bringing back no information of value. End of the Appendix Read by Gail Timmerman Vaughan End of Pioneer Work in the Alps of New Zealand A Record of the First Exploration of the Chief Glaciers and Ranges of the Southern Alps By Arthur Paul Harper